Good evening and welcome to the August 1st special meeting of the City of Arcadia's Planning Commission. This is a public meeting and if any member of the public would like to make a comment on any items, there are several ways. If you're on Zoom, you can raise your hand and the when the public comment period opens, you'll be unmuted and you'll have approximately three minutes to speak. I don't have the, the clock right here. Um, if you're on your phone, you can also join the meeting and comment by pressing star nine. Um, if you're in attendance, you can approach the podium and make your comment. Again, you'll have approximately three minutes to speak. Um, this meeting is now officially called to order. Director Loya. Um, can we get a roll call? Chair Fasade Elcock. Here. Uh, uh, Vice Chair Davies. Here. Commissioner Figueroa. Here. Commissioner Barstow. Here. Commissioner Mayer. Here. Commissioner White. Here. And, and Commissioner Tagney. Here. And at the staff's table, we have Dilo Freitas, Senior Planner, and I think I saw Jennifer Dart, who's the direct, direct, Deputy Director of Community Services. Is there anybody else? That takes care of us. Okay. So we don't have a consent calendar. This is a special meeting. So we, but we are going to open it up to oral communications. Is that right, David, for a special meeting? Yeah, there's a public comment period um, just after the call to order. So if people okay, have. Well, I already called the order while you were back there. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm just confirming that yes, there's a public comment period for matters that are not on the agenda. Okay, does any member of the public have a comment on matters not on the agenda? I don't have my clock, so it's going to be about three minutes, so please step forward. Good afternoon. My name is Eric Loudenslager, and I am a director of the Arcata Fire Protection District, Division 4, and I came to... Uh, chat with you, present some things that uh, the fire district will be faced with um, owing to the gateway plan and um, the expanded population in the general plan. And we wanted to, I've, I've called in to one of your meetings early on, gave a, gave a short presentation. This one won't be very much different. I also called in when the planning department had a local area meeting er, very early on about the, the general plan and expressed some of our um, concerns. I've been um, not able to attend all the meetings via Zoom, um, but I've actually looked at all of them, um, gone through them. Um, they've been very helpful. Thank you. It's nice to have that. Um, the fire department will face several challenges, three big ones owing to um, the gateway plan, although we, we are yet to see exactly what configuration that might be. Um, our, th our three biggest challenges we'll face is one with building height. The second is water availability infrastructure. And um, the third one is access for emergency vehicles. And we have uh, a few specific comments and um, requests with regard to those. The first with building heights, um, going to eight stories high, and I'm not sure how, you know, how high the will ultimately go, but going to eight high uh, moves, moves us into the mid-range and high-range building height, um, and we're not equipped to handle it. And our budgetary mechanisms for getting additional funds um, are, are not easy for us to get more funds. So um, the fire department will be put in potential crisis and jeopardy for being able to serve the emergency needs of the Arcata community and the fire district in general um, with heights that way. We requested in a letter on the um, planning of the EIR um, that there be an analysis in there of what the fire department needs would be with different height buildings. And we were hoping that um, there would have been some interaction and, and dialogue between the fire district um, and the folks that are developing the EIR so that we would have, uh, you know, some sort of um, basis 
for the outcomes of that analysis so that both the planning commission, the planning department, the city, and the fire district would be on the same page when that um, analysis comes out um, so that you know we all can concur with its findings. Um, we haven't had any contact about that kind of analysis. We, at least at this point in time, when the EIR comes out, we would like to see the sections that are addressing the fire district needs um, before it's actually published so we can prepare um, for what's in there uh, and, and whether we perceive that um, as adequate or not. So that, that's um, one request and um, perspective that the fire district has. The second um, has to do with um, the code, the gateway zoning code, the form code. Um, I watched the um, presentation by um, Ben Noble, and um, that was intriguing for us. The fire department, fire district has certain responsibilities um, within the fire code and, and you know, how buildings are um, laid out and designed and those sorts of things. Uh, so with regard to the form code, um, the fire district would like to have input and be involved when developing things like the streetscape, which involve being able to get equipment in to the areas. We would like to have an opportunity to review and participate in developing things like building facades, because those, when you look at um, you know some of the code form codes that are out there, um, they involve where the parking is and how you get into parking areas, and all this bears on um, whether and how convenient it is feasibility for getting um, emergency services into those areas, and while. Certainly, the planners um, have the lion's share of the responsibility of developing those plans. I think that the expertise that the fire department, fire district can bring um, to looking at those and interacting with the people that are developing those plans uh, could make an important contribution to making them better, um, leading to fewer conflicts down the road. Um, and having a more successful outcome um, for the city of Arcata and the people in the Gateway District. One of the challenges that we've had is it, it's not clear, it may be clear to some other members of the public, it certainly isn't clear to me, um, exactly how the flow of these documents there's the gateway plan, there's the EIR, and there's the, the form code, and exactly how those are going to inform each other and how they're gonna come forward um, is not at all clear. And it seems incomprehensible to me that a recommendation on building height could come out of the planning commission or the city council until we have a full economic analysis of what it's gonna cost the city of Arcata citizens and the fire district to actually provide the protection there. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Good afternoon. I wanted to bring up what I addressed last time I was here as far as the grand jury report on the sea rises and hopefully you've all had a chance to, to read that. Um, one particular concern that I, that I saw in there was that it specifically said that the, the bay is sinking and it also had a partic particular uh, issue with uh, large buildings being built on wetland areas, which uh, the Barrel District is a formal, formal wetland area. It's also, had issues with uh, levees that are going to either, you know, we think of the water going over it, but it's gonna seep through. Um, the Barrel District is right next to Samoa Boulevard, which is a levee, and then you have levees to the south of that. So it seems like um, you're going in a, a direction that's counter to that report and also um, another area that uh, David did a really good job addressing was the lower G as far as the uh, uh, treatment plant. Um, 
And what, what was the result as far as a backup plan? Because that's going to go under in the, in the future with, you know, basically you're saying 10 years that Antarctica might be completely melted. And so what is the, the plan exactly as far as we're going to move that? And I thought one of the alternatives was the barrel district to put that. So you're, you're sort of tying the hands of um, future city and citizens if you're going to build in that particular area and not have a a backup plan for that. Um, the other area that I addressed uh, in the environmental impact import report was um, uh, NOAA's report on mapping for tsunami. And they, pre they pretty much had the gateway area as a tsunami zone. Now, now it's not as the same risk as the sewer plant and that level, but it still is a tsunami zone. So, I mean, and I put a little bit of detail into that, that in Japan in 2011, that basically city planners there thought that they were pretty safe and 19,000 people died. So, I mean, I have some big concerns about that. Um, and the other issue is somewhere buried in some of these letters, there was a university professor that wrote in that basically felt that that was like the worst area to build because of being a wetland and also deposits from rivers. And he was pretty much screaming that this is not the appropriate spot to be doing that. So um, those are my concerns. And it potentially, um, I don't really understand why those things weren't addressed in the beginning of the process. Seems like pretty late in the game with all the energy and um, money and the time of the staff is put into this, but those are pretty important things that um, affect people's lives and also potentially could ruin the city financially if any of these things happen. Um, and there's some cases out there right now where that's happening. So thanks. Thank you. Yes, my name is Fred Wise. Thank you. Uh, there was a discussion at last week's uh, July 26 Planning Commission meeting that I found disturbing. The transcription of that meeting, uh, this part of it, is on the Arcata1.com website. Uh, Commissioner Tagney was asking about the zoning code. He said, um, is this something that we're going to see long before the gateway is through? A community development director responded, uh, the zoning code that's associated with this for a couple of different reasons has been broken apart from the policy work. There's a number of reasons we've cited, including potential conflicts of interest and trying to sort through those. There's too much to go through in this brief time that I have here. On the Arcata1.com website, I have a page devoted to this. It brings up lots of questions. I don't understand any potential conflict of interest that it would have anything to do with the development, that is the development of a form-based code which seems to be something that should be going on at the current time. Um, if there is something that I and everyone does not know about, I would like to have this explained. To continue, uh, Commissioner Tagney went on. He said, do you have any time sense of that? The community development director said, my hope is that we are going to start seeing the beginning of it. I'm going to repeat that. My hope is that we are going to start seeing the beginnings of that. Um, the, and then he went on, this design work is something that we're doing with the community as a first phase, and then we'll see the de develop over the course of the next six months. You'll be seeing some of the work that we're developing in the course of the next six months, but you won't formally see it in public hearing until after all of this is adopted. Uh, Commissioner Mayer spoke. So basically you're saying you're hoping that the gateway plan and presumably the general plan would be adopted and the ER complete before the form-based code would be before the planning commission or the city council. Commissioner, Community Development Director spoke, before you see it as a formal approval, you'll see bits and pieces of it, but the specific detail combined into one document noticed as a public hearing for the Planning Commission to be deliberating, making recommendations to the City Council for adoption. Yeah, I don't think we'll be doing that. This I find disturbing. Um, the Community Development Director has said many times to the Planning Commission over months that you'll be seeing all the documents before having to recommend or not recommend them, and enough time to go through the documents. Anything other than that, to me, defies logic. Clearly what is being described is not what is declared. 
on the Arcata1.com websites, I have some quotes from Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland, because this is what it seems like to me. About 45 minutes later, uh, Commissioner Mayer spoke. And so if we do go ahead with this process, I would expect that neither the Planning Commission nor the City Council adopt any kind of streamlined or ministerial approval policy until we have specified the details of the codes that would then be ministerially approved, which makes sense to me. She went on, legally, there is some rationale behind that too, because until the new codes are duly adopted, the existing zoning policies would apply in that area, she said, I think. And in some cases, those zoning policies would be diametrically opposed to the policies in the gateway plan that is expressing in relative, particularly to the land use density and other things. I'm going to use this opportunity to introduce the notion that seemed apparent from the very beginning that the approval of the gateway plan and the approval of the general plan be separated. That basically the general plan can be approved possibly this year, calendar 2022. The gateway plan be approved by the end of 2023. They can be discussed concurrently as we're doing, if that's not too confusing. It seems to be making progress in that. But full recommendations and discussions take place over a longer period of time. The community development director has mentioned, both here and the city council, the notion that the gateway plan, <clears throat> excuse me, cannot be split apart from the general plan because of the secret policy called piecemealing, which prohibits the plan from being split into its pieces. I'm not an expert, I know that, but my understanding that piecemealing is applicable when there is an attempt to defraud the people or the state by misrepresenting an overall cumulative effect of smaller projects, we would not be doing that. We would not be making an attempt to defraud, just doing it to help our process. Uh, lastly, the letters are now online up through the end of May, which is a big improvement. Uh, they're expected to be updated every two months. I don't see why that can't be more frequent, and I would be happy to help with that if possible. Uh, there's a letter, uh, the, the, the ones online do include the ones that have been missing since April and before from February, some of them. Um, there's a letter from Scott McBain and Chris Richards, which they understood would be in this packet that is not in this packet. Um, I have said, and I continue to say, I think staff is overworked. It's, um, it's not, it's, there's just too many things to do to make a successful project like this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do we have anyone online, David? Yeah, we do. Go ahead, Lulu. Can you all hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you. Great. Um, my name is Lulu Michelson. I've been able to join some of your meetings over the last few months. I'm a renter in Arcata and someone with um, extensive professional experience in the housing policy space, um, working for most recently um, the Los Angeles Mayor's office. And are you also able to hear me? Because I'm hearing a little echo. I just wanted to make sure. Yeah, I'm sorry, you're coming in perfectly clear. Do we have any hot mics? Perfect. No, that's fine. I'm happy to ha deal with the echo on my end. So I'm also here with the hat uh, of being one of the co-directors of the Redwood Coalition for Climate and Environmental Responsibility, also known as Rocker. And I just want to say that I think we're still very much watching this process. We're um, heartened that it seems like it's a how we get to the gateway plan and not if we get to the gateway plan, because I think, um, I hope you've heard um, from so many folks who are, are renters in our community, working class people who want to stay in Arcata, uh, folks who want to raise their families here and be contributing members, and folks who are struggling to stay housed as it currently is, that this plan is just is so desperately needed. And I think it just feels important to call out the, the human cost um, associated with not taking action and making sure that we're doing everything possible to address the housing crisis in our community. So I just want to say that I think um, we've been incredibly impressed by the work that's been coming out of the city on this, um, the way that the Gateway Plan has been designed, and I know today we're talking about design guidelines and community benefits, is really the cutting edge of thoughtful, equity-centered community planning. It reflects some of the most thoughtful work that I've seen and much better resource bigger cities and I think that the process has been um, incredibly inclusive and you know obviously uh, commend staff's heroic effort to make these meetings which you know as a as a working member of our community I really struggled to show up and, and through Rocker we've been trying to, to keep um, a voice here but I would just say that I hope that we kind of continue to move forward um, with this sort of 
um, possibility mindset of figuring out how to make this work and not, um, you know, not getting too uh, bogged down in, um, in process to not see the bigger picture that we so desperately need housing. And that there's really a, a huge cost to our community about not moving forward and thinking about thoughtful infill development. And I just want to call out that the cost is increased street homelessness and increasing homeless uh, pop, you know, a population in our community. It's seeing a huge amount of displacement of working class people, which means folks moving to communities that are farther away with, with longer commutes in cars. Um, which leads to kind of increased pollution in our community. And it actually means people having to leave the North Coast altogether. You know, if you can't live in a place like Arcata, which so few people can afford these days, either as a renter and definitely as a homeowner, um, it's going to be really hard for us to fill service jobs, our waiters, our nurses, our nurse assistants, our teachers. You know, if we don't start to really create opportunities to build affordable housing in our community, we're going to see ripple effects that it's, are even hard to imagine, but I've seen them in other places, and the impact is so extreme. So I just want to remind us that, you know, even if we're in comfortable housing situations, you know, I have a great rental, feel really fortunate. It took me a long time to find that. I know many of you on the commission are homeowners, you're, you're, you have that stability, but there's so many people in our community that are struggling, and this plan is really, um, has been laid out in both our housing element and in our sort of collective imagining over the past few years as the answer to that crisis. And I just want to continue to see us making, making progress there. Thank you. Thank you, Lulu. Go ahead, Chris. Oh, yeah, thanks, David. Uh, Chris Richards here, uh, resident. Uh, responsible Growth Arcata member. Um, I don't have a whole lot, but I just wanted to give uh, Kimberly a little bit of an update on some work we've been doing on trying to organize a scientific study as part of the Gateway uh, G GPAC proposal. We're trying to, to get together an advisory committee, and that would be one of the things that they, they could be dealing with potentially. Um, if, uh, we've we've sent an official proposal to council, and and you guys have probably all seen that. So we're we're trying to move forward with that and and get that developed where it will work well for for staff and and planning commissioners and council and the community, of course. So um, anyway, uh, I don't have a lot of the details, but we have been in contact with a company that does these uh, that does surveys and. Uh, we're getting the details together on that that we can bring back soon. So I wanted to update you on that. Um, I, I also wanted to comment on something uh, Fred said. Uh, uh, we had submitted a letter, I believe back in March, where we also uh, brought mention to the benefits of splitting the gateway uh, plan draft out of the general plan and for a variety of reasons. And, I, you know, I'll, I'll get back to you with more information on that. But I just wanted to remind you that this has been an ongoing discussion. And there's definitely some benefits with that. And th there's also some details uh, around the way that it's written and the way that we've got some members that are having to do recusals. Uh, there, there's some, some pretty good details that I'm in the final uh, uh, final research of uh, coming up with something that's definite uh, from the Fair Political Practices Commission that details uh, the problems with the way that this is going, uh, with the two plans being uh, the gateway being an element inside of, of the, the general plan. And this, this stupid, you know, this darn recusal issue is, is definitely an issue with that because it's being used with, with one of our mal impact report and the way that they've written the policies around how people are supposed to recuse. Uh, there, there are some issues, I, but um, I, I'll get back to you with more on that. And um, I think that's all I have. Anyway, thank you for all your work. And uh, I look forward to seeing how you guys dive through this, this, this meeting. Take care. Thanks, Chris. Go ahead, Jim. Hello, David, uh, staff, and to Planning Commission. First of all, I'd just like to thank you for your continual endeavor to uh, 
try to get in the details of this plan. It is important. I know some people are impatient, but uh, from my perspective, I think this is very valuable, and in the end, we'll have a, a quality plan because of it. Um, I would like to follow up and circle back on my request for the forthcoming uh, malleable form-based codes in the form of a draft, codes that will begin to define building heights, siding, stepbacks, and setbacks, um, specifically to existing neighborhoods and to address things such as solo shadowing, codes that can be reviewed and not be stuck with. Also, um, eventually we'll see the real connection between the uh, existing community en engagements and possibly what's being proposed in uh, community benefits. And finally, I just wanted to put a little pitch in for uh, traffic safety. Um, they have moved forward to, um, to hopefully request a, a linear park on uh, the L Street corridor, which I think could be really beneficial as a as a green space and serve the, as, serve the area as a whole. Thank you. All right, thank you. Go ahead, Jane. Hi there. You're going to have an interesting meeting tonight because you're actually being asked to compare policies with community amenities or benefits. And I think there's a very important need to distinguish um, what objective standards you wish that you want to consider requirements for the plan versus amenities or benefits, because you may find that many of the so-called amenities or benefits are ones you want to actually be requirements. I also uh, agree that I don't think it's appropriate to try to ask the city council members to pass on plans at a policy level without having the specific details of the objective standards. Uh, you don't have to have the form-based codes. You simply need objective standards. I mean, it'd be nice to have the form-based codes, but if you set the standards for building height, density, um, streetscapes, all those things, um, that is what you build the form-based code from. So what you have to have, I, in my opinion, is a very specific discussion on the specific objective standards you want, because those are what the state will require you to evaluate developments proposed against. So you need those standards. You shouldn't be required or be asked to make to pass something without having a clear understanding of what the objective standards are. If you don't have that information, you need to be asking for that information, which is why you will be receiving a proposal for establishing a community advisory committee, uh, which if you don't have it yet, you will be getting it next week. I believe we're having a presentation at the next planning commission meeting on the 9th where we will be laying that out, but you will get a copy of that in advance so that that can be more explicitly discussed and understood. It's an implementation plan for how to make that happen. Um, let's see. I didn't really prepare this, so I just wrote a couple of notes to myself. Um, the 331 proposal from RGA uh, request the separation from the land use plan for, and the gateway plan. And I think that should be a serious subject of discussion of the pros and cons of that because you could meet uh, the, I believe there's an August 31st requirement for passing the land use plan. I don't think there's much debate over the land use plan provisions. You've been going through that. Uh, I think you should seriously discuss whether you wish to um, promote passing of the land use plan and then spending the time to really dig into the specifics of the gateway plan and using the community advisory committee as a vehicle for helping do that as we use the Plaza Improvement Task Force very successfully. Anyway, that's enough for the day. You've got a very busy committee meeting and good luck at tackling um, the specifics that you'd like to be discussing relative to the policy levels that you've been left. You've been making all your discussions at the policy level. Well, you need to get down to the specifics, and that's where many of the amenities 
sit. So good luck with that. Thank you for all you're doing. You're spending an enormous amount of time, and so are we. So <laughs> we're trying to be very helpful. We want to see this be a wonderful plan for the city of Arcata, uh, both the land use plan and the gateway plan. We need housing, but we need it to fit into Arcata and take into account all the issues of infrastructure, so such as was discussed with the fire uh, from in the fire department area and from the, all the environmental issues of sea level rise, earthquakes, etc. Thank you so much. Good luck. Thank you, Jane. Again, we're looking for public comments on items that are not on tonight's agenda. Mm, sorry about that. That's okay, Jane. Thank you. Please step forward. We. Okay, we'll go back. Let's let her go first. Hey, um, I was not planning to speak tonight. Um, my name's Beverly Steichen, and I'm a long-term resident of Arcata. My family has most literally shed our blood, sweat, and tears in Arcata, and um, we're, we're local. Um, I only came up to speak because um, the very articulate woman who mentioned moving here from LA and um, very much in favor of the Gateway program as is it sounded. Um, I've also lived in LA. Um, I would like for no one from LA, San Francisco, um, San Diego to be reflecting on what our culture is going to be in this town. Um, I understand the need for more housing. Um, I would like for the council to take to heart that the culture of Berkeley has been destroyed by their housing programs that have not been planned to protect their culture. Um, I've recently read an article that People's Park is going to be closed or perhaps has already been closed for student housing or low income housing or something to be built on it. Um, Berkeley's destroyed because of inappropriate housing plans that didn't match the culture of Berkeley. Many parts of Portland, Oregon destroyed because plans didn't take into consideration the culture of Portland. And Santa Barbara, another very unique, beautiful community, um, in the process of being damaged, if not destroyed, because of housing programs that don't match the culture of Santa Barbara. We also have a very unique place up here. And I don't want somebody coming in from LA really having a loud voice and saying, oh, yeah, I'm just in from LA. And so this is what I think is a great idea. Um, sit around for a while, learn the culture of Arcata, and then speak would be my advice. And I just beg you guys to um, reconsider and, if need be, replan to maintain our culture because um, the people of Berkeley who have been there for decades and for generations deserve their culture and it's been robbed from them. And I would like the culture of Arcata and our community here to remain intact. Um, thank you. Thank you, Beverly. Did you say we had one more person on the phone or a couple more? Go ahead, Patricia. Um, yeah, I'm, I'll keep it really brief because I know you have a lot to do tonight. Um, so I just wanted to um, let you know that, sorry, I have reverb on my side, but you'll let you know that somebody um, isn't turning off their mics um, during oral communication. Um, sometimes it's been happening a lot on the other committee meetings as well. Um, so I just wanted to remind you all to, to turn off your mics because so, there's a lot of background um, interference noise that comes up through somebody's mic when um, certain people are talking, um, the phone and people are talking. So I just wanted to throw out there just as a reminder. So thank you very much for everything you're doing. Thanks, Patricia. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll look into that. Maybe a tech solution uh, we can apply. Um, that looks like all the uh, early oral communication. All right. Thank you. So now we're going into new business, which is the reason we're here, which is to consider the uh, gap with emphasis on the design and community developments chapter. Do we have a staff report or do you have anything that you... Uh, 
Um, yeah, I guess I'll uh, just briefly orient to the materials um, and also offer that I'm happy to address any of the comments that came up if the Planning Commission wishes. Um, certainly have some, some input on um, many of those items um, and can direct people to, uh, to those uh, materials. Um, first thing I wanted to note just as a, um, you know, just as a matter of uh, organization, uh, somehow a page got cut off from the community de development, uh, I'm sorry, community benefits and development standards. Um, and so I've got that loaded up here. This is the, uh, the page, it's the first page in the chapter, uh, chapter two, uh, which is uh, attachment to your, uh, attachment A to your packet, second part of it. And this is the part that really explains the community amenities. And I know the, the Planning Commission wanted to talk about these, so I'll have this up on the screen. And we can, uh, you know, certainly zoom in on these and, uh, you know, dig into to questions and details on these. Again, this is a, a draft. You know, I've heard many people say, well, you know, these should be uh, standards and not amenities, not, you know, not taken as, um, uh, you know, as, as community benefits that, uh, you know, streamline development. And so that is certainly one of the, uh, the topics of conversation is, you know, which of these uh, you know, should be the categories that we try and find support around. Uh, which of these do you want to remove from this list? This is a draft. That's what you can do with a draft is you can modify it. Um, I will say that this list of community amenities came from extensive uh, work with the committees uh, that we put forward a list of amenities that was sourced from our current general plan. Uh, we had about um, 300 or so uh, various items that were sourced from the general plan that were prospective community amenities. We cir uh, circulated those amongst the, the various committees in uh, 2020, I believe it was, um, and came back with a list of, uh, you know, amenities that should be included and incorporated into the zoning for this. And so what you see in table six here are the, the buckets, the kind of categories that these various amenities would fit within not necessarily the amenities itself. And so some of these, you know, I'm, you know, the first one that jumps out at me is Creek Daylighting you see here. Creek Daylighting uh, is gonna have very limited application. Uh, it is a very uh, expensive uh, endeavor. Uh, it would contribute greatly to the community. And so this bucket is also something that I would, you know, classify as a community amenity. Um, you know, rapid production of new housing. You know, I think that that is a goal or an objective of this. And so th if that is a, if that's something that the, you know, commission, the planning, the planning commission, the city council wish to see as a, an amenity, you know, some, some community benefit, we want housing and we want it now, then crafting a specific program around rapid production of new housing that is targeted specifically to the amount of new housing that we want over a given period of time, and that would be the amenity. So, so this one, rapid production of new housing, sounds kind of vague and ambiguous. That's because it's a big bucket within which we could create specific community benefit programs. And so there's, there's a mix of different things in here, some that are buckets that you know, are, are uh, you know, higher level, and some that are real specific targeted things that could actually be implemented as amenities. And we can go through those in any order that you wish. Um, we continued this, this hearing from the last one because you wanted to talk about uh, streetscape and design standards uh, in coordination with these community amenities and benefits. And so I excerpted the, the two, those two policy chapters uh, for you here today. And, um, you know, I think that the uh, Planning Commission's deliberations were sort of guiding this discussion. And so I'll just respond to, you know, questions and concerns uh, that come up. I'll try and help guide you to where in the document the policies are, whether they're in these two chapters or elsewhere in the document. So I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have and address any of the public comment that you felt like needed to be addressed at this time. Who wants to start? Scott? I just wanted to take you up on your offer to address some of the public comments and hear the city's perspective on the concerns of the fire department, given the importance of considering eight story buildings in the overall density of the gateway. Um, what's the city's sort of thinking on addressing those concerns? 
Yeah, um, thank you for that. And um, before I address that, um, I want to reiterate, uh, and Eric, I think, is left, but you know, hopefully he's going to tune in. He said he's watching these, so hopefully I'll tune in for this. Um, I want to reiterate that the document came out as a draft with eight story buildings proposed in one district uh, and not eight stories all over the district. That was never the intent, but there, there was one district where there was potential for eight story buildings. Now, I want to recognize that the goal is still as I understand it, to have a high density zone. Um, and so, so there will be larger stature buildings. So I want to recognize that as well. I also want to restate for the record that SAF has heard from many public members. There is a, uh, a group of public members certainly who feel like eight stories is not too much. You know, I've heard that from some, but the overwhelming majority of public members have said, look, eight is way too much. Um, including a group, uh, a stakeholder group of architects that we pulled together and, you know, wanted to get their sense since that's their business, you know, working in, in um, uh, building design. And so staff is bringing forward a recommendation to the city council, you know, certainly to consider eight, that's what's in the draft now, but, you know, what we've heard, we're going to be passing on to them and we're passing that on to you now, uh, is a recommendation for reducing the building height. Okay, so that was not his specific concern. His specific concern wasn't necessarily eight as a trigger, but larger stature buildings. Um, so there's two things that I heard him say is that, you know, there's gonna be costs associated with it. There, there should be some study associated with what those costs are. And, the, uh, and there will be impact to services based on, you know, building out larger stature buildings. We've recognized that, we've recognized it from the start. We have had those discussions with Arcata Fire staff uh, since the very beginning, uh, since prior to the beginning of the release of this draft, in fact, uh, have continued to extend an offer to get together with our Kyoto volunteer st fire staff uh, to discuss those concerns, uh, have made the um, offer to come and speak with the board, with their board, uh, and have a, a you know, time to you know, talk about the plan and, and make sure that we hear their concerns. And that offer is still ongoing. Um, we are just now getting into the development of the EIR and uh, are starting to work through the special studies that are needed to, um, to evaluate those environmental uh, effects. And so we haven't gotten to the point yet where they're developing that particular study on, on public safety. Certainly when it, uh, we do get that point, to that point, uh, you know, our consultants will be reaching out to the various agencies that provide public services, whether it's you know, police, fire, medical, um, so on and so forth to ensure that, you know, uh, their concerns are incorporated into the documents. Um, you know, in terms of the, the economics uh, of this, you know, certainly there are, um, you know, it's, it would be inconceivable to imagine buying the pieces of infrastructure that the Arcata Fire needs uh, currently, given the scale of development we have. Um, but over time in the future, you know, as we grow, um, there may be a point when those buildings are feasible, cost feasible, and they're being built. And it's also cost feasible and reasonable to have a mitigation measure that says, when you build a building over X stories tall, you have to contribute to a fund. And that fund then goes towards, you know, purchasing new uh, equipment for uh, services that cur can't currently be provided. So that's, that's generally what I anticipate the EIR will say as a mitigation measure for that is that, you know, in, you know, once you cross a certain level of development, you need to, you know, buy a fire truck that is able to service that. And there's a uh, ex exaction program that's associated with that, that each project that comes in, you know, uh, from this point forward will pay into that to help support those additional services. Can I follow up on uh, how tall are the taller buildings in Eureka? And do you know how tall their big ladder truck can go? You know, I'd, ha I'd have to research that. I don't have the, that information off the top of my head. Uh, I can tell you in Arcata, you know, our buildings max out at about 50, 55 feet. Um, and we only have a couple of them at this point. I, I just want to point out what to me is uh, the obvious when you're saying that if someone's going to build an eight-story building and they're going to have to contribute money towards the fire department for a truck, of course, the truck only lasts, what, 10, 15 years. So, when you ask a developer to do all that, that adds the cost to development, which means it's not going to be affordable. I just, I think we need to be realistic here. We want affordable housing. We want, um, the city is not building 
the house the housing I feel some people think just hurry up and approve this plan so the city can build it the city's not building it we have to attract developers who it's going to be economically feasible for them to come in and build so we have to have a plan where they're going to be attracted to this area they're going to want to come in and build right away and they're going to provide affordable housing and but if we're going to lay all these fees on the developer they're going to pass that on to the to the tenant so I feel like we're I just wish we were a little a little more realistic so this could actually happen so yeah that's that is a obvious. very good point and I think that you know part of the uh, you know the the original um, intent of this and if you look through the the goals uh, of the underlying uh, purpose for this document is that we do create a planning document that allows for feasible development um, and you know at the same time we ha we absolutely have to balance the fact that you know the development is going to need infrastructure there are going to be many different ways of bringing that infrastructure forward I mentioned an exaction program there's probably going to be a component of it um, the reality is though is that when new development comes in the property taxes will also increase uh, the volunteers get um, some of their their funds is through property taxes and so to the extent that we have new development new investment coming in and those property taxes increase all of the budgets from taxing entities that rely on property taxes go up uh, so that's a component of it um, there's also in this plan a um, uh, implementation program to evaluate establishing an uh, enhanced infrastructure financing district which is essentially an area within which the you know the city and other taxing entities can agree to forego the taxes that they receive in that area and contribute those instead to um, you know to, to the repayment of bonds so you can leverage those future taxes on uh, bond financing to pay for infrastructure that you need now that you can't afford uh, now but you will need for you know both the the current development and future development so that's another way to help pay for these and then in addition you know we have you know we've been very successful as a city and and this area uh, in general is getting higher attention from the state for uh, you know for for grant funds um, one of the grant sources that the city itself has been uh, successful at obtaining uh, that I'd love to talk with the the fire uh, district and you know and other agencies that find themselves with these infrastructure needs um, uh, about is the uh, infill infrastructure grant when we bring into the community uh, these dollars from the state when we have affordable housing projects that leverage those dollars we can spend them on a whole variety of different things uh, we've uh, you know we're purchasing buses we're doing street improvements we're doing water line improvements there's no reason why we couldn't if we needed you know a new ladder truck say hey you know we need a ladder truck and so we're going to commit this IIG funding to that ladder truck purpose so I don't mean to I, I totally agree with you chair I don't mean to infer that the development is going to have to shoulder the entire burden of services that benefit the entire community any other questions down here yeah, yeah can I just say something in respects to as in regards of the professional opinions of the you know the architectural community you've received um, as we build up we also must build down so you know with these sorts of structures we have deep foundations so I'm imagining you're also in consultation with geotechnical engineers engineering geologists and engineers civil engineers so I, I imagine that's what you're doing but I definitely encourage you know continuing that discussion because as if we build up we must build down so just putting that out there Can I ask a quick question? Yes. Uh, David, for uh, clarification, the, most of the downtown can be built up to 45 feet now. Is that correct? Yeah. And as we go out into the Barrel District or uh, you know what will be the gateway, much of that or some of that could be built up to that same height. Is that correct? Yeah. The um you're, you're, you're given a perfect segue into the uh, PowerPoint presentation I'm, I'm preparing for the uh, August 23rd joint study session we're going to go over a lot of that most of the area that is uh, like 90% of the area that is identified as gateway area plan area uh, currently is allowed to build up to 45 feet tall um, the commercial uh, can go up to 35 feet and then there are some residential medium and residential high density and residential low density areas um, 
that can develop up to 38 feet. So, but the vast majority of the area is 45 feet. So if we didn't even do the gateway project, there could be some projects that just happen to be in what we're calling the gateway that could go up to the same four stories. Um, what I'm kind of nudging at is that if, if we do decide as a community to take eight stories off the table, then the only difference we're doing is four to six, perhaps. And I don't know why we think in even numbers on this. And this is kind of a question that is also in the back of my mind is um, I remember on the Sorrel project, or I think it was that one, the description of after you go over two stories, you have to put in an elevator. So nobody wants to build three stories. You got to go to four to pay for the elevator and justify the project, something like that. And I imagine that there's a lot of finances. I think it came up in one of the oral presentations one night about the economy of scale of these projects as you go above certain stories and when we get our community amenities out of the project. You know, if we said you have to build three, there's no incentive for community amenities because they had to put in the elevator and they didn't get to go to the fourth store where we might get our amenities. So I don't have any way to figure this out without some support from staff or geotechnical or some kind of civil engineering or somebody that's been in the business or something. But it feels like that's the game that we're all faced with kind of figuring out, you know, when, when do these amenities kick in? Um, you know, we have to let higher development to get the amenities, but at what point? Um, and how much amenity do we get from each project? Yeah, that's, a, that's a really good question, too. Um, the, uh, and this, this page is in your packet, but I'll just put it on the screen here so that folks can see it. Um, and I wish I had a much, much bigger screen, but I don't. Um, so, so backing up one step, you know, our job is, you know, we certainly want to make sure that, uh, you know, the develop that we, we set development thresholds that are high enough that allow for the development to, to pencil. We, um, if you set the development thresholds too low, I think what you're getting at with this idea of a three, three story building, um, you're, you're just never going to get any of those because you, you don't cross the, the, at least under current market conditions, you don't cross the, the feasibility threshold. And so, you know, what we're grappling with is making sure that we have a, you know, a building envelope that is large enough to allow these projects to pencil, given that we want to have, you know, these particular community amenities. Um, and, um, and also, uh, you know, see those, those developments actually built. The, the community amenities are, some of them are going to be uh, completely analogous with and, and very similar to uh, what they would have received as conditions of approval. Uh, if, if the project came through as a planning commission review project, a discretionary project, you have the authority to issue conditions of approval that, you know, are, are within, you know, nexus and proportionality uh, boundaries. And so, you know, for example, if the site doesn't have sidewalks, you can condition the, si the sidewalks be built uh, to the project. And so there's certainly going to be some community amenities that are of that nature. Um, and, and the reason for that is because, you know, those, those sort of core basic uh, conditions of approval are still going to be necessary when, when projects come in. We're still going to need those little bits and pieces of infrastructure to be built out. Um, but we also, through this community benefits program, can get more than you would be able to get through a standard condition of approval. There, there are bigger and broader kinds of, of conditions like requiring, uh, you know, public space. Right now, a perfect example of this is right now, uh, we have 50 foot wide rights of way. And so that allows for, with all the travel lanes and other things that we're trying to accomplish with our transportation network, that leaves about five feet for the sidewalks. Five feet for a walkable community for a sidewalk is not enough. You cannot walk you know, to abreast and then pass by another person on a five foot sidewalk. And so it just doesn't work. So with the community amenities, we can actually say, look, you're going to give, you know, a 10 foot setback, but it's going to appear like you're built right on the, the edge of the, the walk because you're going to build into that, you know, another five foot of sidewalk so that we have, you know, a 10 foot wide sidewalk and maybe five feet of landscape stripping. And so 
with this community amenities program, you know, we can require that. They're going to actually offer it uh, because uh, we, because, you know, they're, they're streamlining their process. That's how the, the streamlined piece is tied to it. Um, we couldn't request that. We couldn't require that from a project if it was pure discretionary review because the, the city just doesn't have nexus to ask for that. So, so we definitely are going to see, I mean, that there's a, a little bit of an agreement that happens in the way that it's structured right now that the developer is recognizing, I not only have the cost of my building, but I have the cost of these other conditions that are gonna be placed on me that I'm gonna select from. Um, and in exchange for that, they have a guaranteed pathway. Um, this planning commission has been really good historically about approving projects that fall neatly within the bounds of the, the land use code and the policies in the general plan. Um, we've had a couple of projects that have been doozies, no doubt. Um, and the project that I often refer back to, the, the village student housing project, as, as sort of like an example of how extreme the public process can get, um, that one was special because that was that was a legislative action. We were actually changing zoning. And so you want to take, you know, special consideration when, when changing the zoning. Um, but it's an example of how a, you know, project was basically worn down by the process. By the time they got to the end of that process after 17 plus hearings, they, they had a clear path to approval. Uh, but the conditions that were put on them by that point they just, the project couldn't bear it anymore. And so they walked away. So when you have a project process, a review process like that, um, other developers, when they see that, they're less likely to want to enter your community and develop. If you lay out, after you've worked with the community and said, hey, what do we all want? If you lay that out, put it in a plan, say this is exactly what we want, we have a clear pathway for you to come to it, whether it's a you know, ministerial approval at the planning commission or over-the-counter ministerial approval with you know, real clear guidance, Whatever that process ultimately looks like, um, you know that is the big exchange for these community benefits, and so that's that holding cost, that uncertainty has value. That gets back to the time value or time cost uncertainty, you know. And as you increase any one of those, you're increasing all of them, right? So our job is not necessarily to figure out, well, you know, is a three-story going to pencil? Is a four-story going to pencil? Our job is to create bounds that allow, as the market to fluctuate, to the, that the, the developers can come in and then have the flexibility to build that and ensure that we extract out of that process those community benefits that we need. I sent to the Planning Commission, and I'll put it in the packet. We're going to put it on our website. Pretty interesting uh, uh, economic analysis of this. It's, it's conceptual, but it's, it's an economic analysis that looks at three different models for evaluating how projects, uh, you know, um, uh, the feasibility of projects based on the density and looks at all the different variables that are associated with that. I strongly encourage the Planning Commission and the public to review this, uh, you know, because it, it, it's pretty in-depth, but, you know, but if you skim it, you can get the, the gist of it. Or if you dig into the detail, you can get a, a pretty good education on how these things come together. Those factors, those variables that make a project pencil, they're going to vary by region. They're going to vary by, you know, the, the housing location, what, you know, what that market is. And they're going to vary over time. As markets get pressurized, as I think our market is, you start to move more towards uh, being able to viably pencil higher density projects. It's quite likely that an eight-story building in the next 10 or 20 years will never even be financially viable. Um, it, but if, if the market conditions are there and we allow for higher densities, then we start to overcome some of the limitations associated with, um, you, know, you know, penciling a, you know, contribution to a fire truck or penciling, you know, some of these other amenities that, we, that we're looking for. John, do you have any? I was going in turn. Do you have any comments, questions? Um, yeah, uh, can I make a comment? Yes. Uh, well, actually, first, two things. First, uh, on the uh, uh, categories of community amenities, uh, I don't think housing creation is an amenity. I think it's a goal of the plan. 
and uh, shouldn't be included as an amenity. Uh, that's just an observation. Um, I've uh, noticed that there's a lot of angst about the height of the buildings that have been proposed. And uh, I think it's highly unlikely that we'll ever see a six or eight story building in Arcata. Uh, so anyway, at this point, I would suggest that the uh, Planning Commission consider uh, declaring a, a four story cap uh, and not sending the, you know, sending the question off to the uh, city council if they want to make it higher. If we, if the uh, uh, gateway plan in, in the general plan uh, caps the uh, height at uh, four stories or 45 feet, if uh, there were a, a, a real need for a taller building, uh, I believe that we possible in, in coming years for the, uh, the Planning Commission, the city government to uh, make that happen, allow it to happen. I, uh, it, it's possible to, uh, uh, that it would be possible that in, in the, the uh, gateway plan, we would have a provision for uh, providing discretionary review of projects that don't meet all the, uh, the, the uh, stated requirements. And uh, I, I think that would allow for the building of a six or eight story building. Um, as I say, I don't think it'll ever happen, but uh, uh, if it, it could, I suppose. Um, also, if, w well, if, if we uh, right now declare that the, uh, the Planning Commission uh, won't support a uh, plan that has more than four stories, uh, that'll, that'll eliminate some of the, uh, the worry that we've heard from so many uh, uh, people in the community. Also, I think uh, it might uh, uh, slightly simplify the, the EIR process. So, my suggestion is to uh, uh, make it clear that, that four stories is the limit that we're going to uh, propose. Okay, thank you. Judith? Yeah, um, thank you for everyone's comments. They're, they're, they're really um, food for thought. Um, and so I've been thinking about all of this a lot um, and losing some sleep over it. Um, but I wanted to bring up a few things relative to the community benefits program, um, but also relative to the um, gateway program and the general plan and our role. Um, the first thing um, was a, a kind of a, a, a an over, overarching issue. Um, when I first heard requests that there be a gateway um, advisory committee or a task force separate from the Planning Commission, um, I thought that was a really not very wise idea because I figured our Planning Commission could really address all of the issues that a task force would reasonably object uh, address and that this forum was the appropriate place to do it. Um, when I've seen the schedule that staff has proposed for all of our processes um, that in effect um, shunts many of those roles over to the city council rather than um, allowing the planning commission to address them um, fully, completely, and prior to the city council's actions, um, I've, I've been thinking that it would be hoove us to at least consider the possibility um, of a gateway task force and that we address that with the City Council at our August 23rd study session. Um, I, I think it's going to come up then anyway, um, but, I, but I believe that we need to actually 
um, address that head on rather than simply sh shunting it over to the city council or staff to say no way. Um, second, um, I think it's really important to remember that we're addressing the gateway plan right now in the context of updating our general plan. And the general plan's vision says explicitly there, that Arcata will grow, but on our own terms. So David has tried to impress upon us that the gateway plan's housing, ambitious housing goals are the way for Arcata to retain control of our own future. Um, by providing the housing that the state's going to tell us we need. Um, and yet, I don't see anywhere that we've actually addressed or attempted to re-envision re or modify the vision section of our general plan. It hasn't been on our schedule. Um, and I think before we go forward um, with either the gateway or the general plan revisions overall, we need to look at that vision. Um, which was developed in 2020. If we're going to be looking at a vision that's still going to work for 2045, it's probably going to look a little bit different. We need to explain how. That's our job as a planning commission. Um, about the community benefits program in general, um, there, there's a long history of planning for density bonuses provided for developments that provide a specified community benefit. Um, usually that's been to provide more affordable or below market housing than a developer would otherwise choose to do. That's the main way in which community benefits programs have been used. Um, the Gateway Plan proposes to use it for a range of other things that go way beyond that. And a lot of form-based codes have been joined up with those types of policies. Um, we're also being told that the whole scheme doesn't work um, if it's then subject to any kind of discretionary review. Um, what I'm seeing in many form-based codes and community benefits programs is that there is some public process, some um, visible public determination of the extent to which a proposal actually does um, comply with, is consistent with the um, objective standards that a form-based code has put forward. Um, it, the idea is there's always going to be some subjectivity in design, and, and by having um, a determination made by a public body, sort of in the way that we do consistency reviews with the general plan, um, it would at least expose those um, determinations to public review. Um, and in the mushy subjective areas, it, it would still be simply a compliance determination, um, but it would allow the public a role in making those determinations after we had developed at great um, length and at great detail, hopefully, the standards to which we'd be judging compliance. Um, so, I'm really wary of a community benefits scheme, um, in effect, um, a bargaining, a trading scheme uh, that would compromise anything that our community does value in order to make development marginally more feasible, in other words, more profitable um, for potential developers. There's some things that we should support possibly in a community benefits trade, there are other things that we should avoid. Um, one of the things that we should avoid is to assume that not penciling out to a specific profit margin um, means that a type of project isn't feasible. It isn't feasible for that particular developer, perhaps. Um, we shouldn't provide extra rewards for construction features that are basic good design in the 21st century. And 
we've been naming a lot of those. Um, energy efficiency, we already require. Um, perhaps our general plan should up the ante on that in general. Um, low net greenhouse gas emissions, um, keeping frontages pleasant, um, keeping stormwater on site, protecting our views of the skies and iconic landscapes, um, the view of the bay from many locations in our city. Um, a lot of those things that I'm seeing in the community benefits program that would get rewarded, I think are probably things that we should put in our standards um, for the entire city. And then we'd be really looking at a, a narrower range of rewards. Um, we shouldn't be trading oranges for apples. Um, and you've already said a seven or eight story pick building is probably off the table at this point, but um, trading height for a semi-public open space, th those are really not equivalent things. Um, and I think there are a few things that we can do to reduce developers' chances of encountering surprises and to support both the community in terms of getting um, more and faster affordable housing and not trading away things that we care about. Um, some of these things are going to cost the city money up front or later. You don't get something for nothing. And I think that the community benefits program, as it's been proposed here, attempts to do that. Um, and so I'm wary about it. Um, one of the things I think that a gateway plan can do is to designate the locations of desired open spaces within the plan area and then acquire that land for the city up front. Do not wait for a major developer to come by and say, oh yeah, I'll do this and I, yeah, I can spare that land. Okay, that's a recipe for getting our desirable open space both later and less public. It's going to cost money. But if it's done soon, if it's done up front in the plan, the cost is going to be a lot lower, in part because the um, cost of acquiring um, underutilized industrial land doesn't take into account the speculative increase in value that comes about with the rezoning. Um, so do it soon. We'll get our public space. We'll have it up front. We may be able to work with a land trust or get grants to help us provide that space. Um, but it's going to be ours. It's not going to be some developer t opening the public space to the public until they feel that their liability has been compromised by some way in which members of the public feel like they want to use that space. Um, a second way is for the city to work with willing current owners to delineate wetlands and other hydrologic features on the surface and below uh, that could limit or development opportunities or possibly provide opportunities for them. Um, takes the risk, takes the surprises away from the developers, and I think that the money that that would save them might be worth a whole lot more than what they would get from um, giving or taking a five-foot frontage to the street. Um, they're, they're not mutually exclusive. But I, I think this is something that, that could actually really support a gateway plan um, to get our city what we, what we want. Um, work with willing current owners to identify and characterize re residual industrial contamination on these former or underutilized or in transition industrial sites. Okay, That's going to save the city from some surprises you bet it's going to save developers from some surprises. And it seems that that's something that's, both of those things are probably going to be things that would come up in the EIR anyway. Let's just do them. 
and then look at the five foot frontages um, and more, not just for the gateway, but for future development throughout the city. We're working with the general plan update now, and this is our opportunity to actually do those things. Um, anything that we're gonna do broadly is then not something we trade back and forth on for the gateway specifically. Um, so it's really important that we go through the proposed community benefits program carefully and that we talk about you know, four, five, or six, or seven, or eight stories. It's good to do it soon. But I think that we need to think deeply about the types of benefits that will actually support developers to develop the types of development that we want to see, and, and those that are really tweaking costs on the margins. Um, so um, that's what I wanted to bring to you right now. Thank you. Kimberly? Judith, this is always a hard act to follow. Um, so what John was talking about is, I think, important because what we have right now is polarization because of the building height. And we all know and ha we all want the same thing, which is we need more housing. And I think that what's slowing things down is the building height. So let's just deal with that up front and then move forward so that we can get housing as soon as possible because we all know we need it. Um, I also feel like uh, Judith was talking about is so many of these community benefits are a given. They shouldn't be a benefit. Um, also, I, I don't see anything built in there that's going to guarantee home ownership or affordability. And that's a concern for me. Um, I think that we should look into some land trusts, absolutely. Um, I think that we just, we have some work to do on the community benefits for sure. And I think that before we can even move forward on anything, we need to um, come to an agreement about the building height. And I am a proponent for getting a community task force committee um, together, sooner the better, so that we can move this forward. Um, as I said, that I, f I see a lot of this dissension could be solved, because um, I think we do and can get on the same page. And I think we actually do want the same thing. Um, but we just keep going around the issues that are holding us up and not dealing with them. So that's what I have to say. Um, well, on the topic of building height, I um, have been a little challenged with eight stories, but six doesn't bother me a bit when I look at the Soro Place at four, just a couple blocks off the plaza and feel like it's fits in just fine right there. And there's a lot of development that could occur over there. And if it was staggered and went up to six, I think that would be comfortable. And I I don't know, um, I don't have a, I mean, I run into a lot of people and get a lot of little tidbits. Not a lot of it very polarized. I, I feel like I have a lot of positive conversations about the Gateway Project. Um, building height for sure is one of the topics that often comes up. Um, and if if we did cap at six, I think it would super soften that discussion uh, or that piece of the discussion. Um, so personally, if we are heading towards some kind of building height, and I love that we're starting to talk about such real things, um, you know, it feels like uh, such a big piece of any aspect of design or community benefits or anything else. Um, it's so core to the whole project. So if we, uh, if we really want to make that a goal, I'm all for that discussion. Uh, I don't know that we have the education, though, you know, in terms of, I mean, we're all touching on whether or not developers need to make money or the community benefits, you know, the community 
goals are first, but they have to be buildable. And I'd sure like to hear from, you know, an industry person or somebody in a city role that's uh, experienced a lot of these similar types of development. I don't want to handcuff this project and feel like, okay, what did we accomplish out of all this? Um, we called that area something, but you still can only build pretty much to what you could have built before. Um, so anyway, I, I'm, I'm up for stirring that pot if, if that's a direction everybody wants to start heading. Okay, so I'm going to make my comments too, and then I don't know if I'll have... Who are you pointing at? And then I was going to either let you or open it up to the community or vice versa, if you want to have the last word, maybe. So um, as far as community, um, the categories of community amenities, a lot of these are, are, aren't like the green building that goes without, they have to do that. The active transportation um, enhanced, I mean, some of this, these aren't really community benefits. Um, housing creation, that's what this whole thing is about. Um, maybe open space is a community amenities, I should say. Green building and sustainability, that's, uh, they have to do that. So I agree with whoever said it before that a lot of these community amenities, um, they already have to do it. And then my other comments were a lot of people said what I wanted to say. Um, there is a lot of, there's a few conflicts within this plan that confuse me. I think this is why we're having so much trouble. Like for example, it says the gateway area plan does not identify land uses, uh, just needs to be pedestrian friendly and human scale. But then somewhere else it'll say, this plan is a tool for implementing to provide a means to achieve regulatory and social demand for more housing. So things con conflict and, and that bothers me. And then, Uh, I'm just going to read everything I was thinking. Um, let's see here. Density. I also had a question for David regarding um, the sorry the um, California density bonus law. What is how does that differ than our community benefits and development standards? Um, how does that work exactly? Maybe you can answer that now before I go on. Yeah, um, so the density bonus law allows for a developer to build at higher densities than the underlying zoning allows for if they bring afford affordable housing to the table. Um, and so <clears throat> our density bonus ordinance allows for 15% um, and 20% above uh, density, depending on whether you're targeting low or very low income households. Um, within the, the, the plan as it's currently conceived, there's really no upper limit on density. And so I'm not exactly sure how it would be applied. I'd need to uh, work with the state to see if that would mean that, you know, additional um, you know, floors would be allowed, but I, I don't think that um, that's the case. The idea here is that, um, and you know, just be super quick on this point, but uh, you know, the, depending on what the market is uh, you know, seeking, the developers wanna build that particular type of unit. And so you'll see the Foster Avenue project that Kramer just built out. Um, you know, he built out 142 micro units um, you know, they're, I don't know exactly how big they are, but they're, you know, they're very, very small, like six, 700 square feet. Um, we've had developers come in, the Tea Gardens has done this, and we had a developer come in who was wanting to do uh, the same thing where they build quads. It's basically four bedroom, four bathroom with a shared kitchen, because technically speaking, a unit is a uh, sleeping facility, uh, uh, sanitary facility, and a kitchen, and that makes a unit by definition. And so four bedrooms, each with their own bathroom and one kitchen is basically four units, but you only count it as one. And so they can stay under the density thresholds that way. And so after seeing this occur, you know, over time, 
Um, you know, and, and what we had discussed, I mean, again, this has been going on for five plus years at this point, um, but what we discussed early on was, hey, let's loosen up the flexibility. Instead of having limits on density and having developers come and try and, you know, jive us around, well, this is really a one, you know, one unit when in fact it's four bedrooms, uh, indicating that the market is driving us towards smaller units right now. Let's allow them to build what the market is asking for so that people can have their own kitchen, for example. Um, there's not an endless market for 700 square foot uh, units. Uh, at some point, people are going to start looking for other products to, to build out. There may be people that want to build other products right now that our, our code doesn't allow for. And so, so because of those, the idea was uh, to build this area without density limits. There's lower density limits. You have to provide at least this many units in order to get the streamlining, but there's no upper density limit, Me making it so the developer can make a choice. Do I build a bunch of four bedrooms or do I build a bunch of one bedrooms? So I don't believe density bonus law would affect this plan. I don't think somebody would come in and say, we want to you know, give you affordable housing as a density bonus. The way it's structured instead is that the affordable housing is one of the community amenities because another goal of this plan is to have mixed income projects. Um, and so, you know, two ways of accomplishing that. One is to reintroduce a, an inclusionary zoning program. Inclusionary zoning requires affordable housing once you get over a certain unit count. Um, and so that would make sure that, you know, with these larger projects that we would have a, you know, a minimum number of affordable units that are affordable to people earning less than 80% area median income in those units. And we could even structure it for moderate income folks if we wanted to. Uh, but then if they wanted to provide more than that, if they wanted to go above and beyond that and provide additional, that could be one of those community amenities. Does that make sense? Yeah. So... For example, say we did cap it at, at four, which I actually think is too small. But let's just say it's it's four stories, and then the density bonus law would kick in and say they wanted to do very low income. They could add another, let's say 20%. I'm just pulling that out of my, anyway. Let's say 20%. So they actually could go to five, right, to, for the to fulfill the 20% density bonus, and I, that's California need, state law. I need to research the relationship because if we don't have a density maximum, there's no, there's nothing to add a bonus to. Who's we? The city. If the city uh, adopted the plan as is currently proposed, there would be no density bonus maximum, uh, no density maximum, and so there's no density bonus to add to that maximum because there's no maximum. So I, I need to look into, to answer your question, I need to do more research to find out if we had a threshold for development standards total number of floors, does that mean that they can go above that threshold for density bonus? I don't think so. That's not the way that the law is written. Um, it's based purely on unit count. Okay, well, that's another thing. I think we should have a maximum in here. I think that's what the public wants. Um, so I said, do we as a community really want staff who happens to be a great staff at the moment, but you know, who knows 10 years from now to decide if an eight story structure in the barrel district provides community benefit and enhances the community and has cohesive identity. Um, I feel like this chapter is the opposite of what the community wants. My idea is anything under four to five stories with specific requirements and following state law, should, those should have the by right approval. Anything lower than that, anything above that should be discretionary. That's what I think the public wants, and that's what I would recommend. Um, I also, um, on, let's see here, do, 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 on GA91, um, suggest not um, locating the building at or near the sidewalk. I mean, that's not professor and friendly, having a building right there. Um, I would rather, what Judith recommended, have it set back a little bit. Um, certain number of feet, maybe a couple of feet. Um, on GA9P, the minimizing impacts on adjacent single family homes, we need to talk about that and suggest ways. We as a commission need to talk about that and suggest ways where we can't have, you know, a huge building next to a little small Victorian and the solar shading is really an issue here in Arcata. Um, we need to work with give the developers some strategies when they come in that they know if you're going to build next to an existing single family home that these these are the criteria i mean they need to be respectful 
um, on the GA9S where they talk about transit infrastructure. I mentioned this before, but I feel like we need to require the larger developers to, to include some sort of turn in lane on their property so that the transit buses are not blocking what is going to be very narrow roadways. So I think it's a safety issue. I think the developer needs to build a place for the, the transit to pull over and not block traffic. Uh, he answered my question about density bonus laws versus community benefit. We now need senior housing. Now that we know our senior housing project that we approved that got bought by Cal Poly, so that's not going to happen. Um, and I agree with John that we, we do need to decide how big we want our buildings. Um, I would, would say five, not four. Um, and my other, my last question at the moment is um, when our recommendations go to the city council, will all the community letters be included or that will they be summarized? I'd prefer that the actual, exactly what the community member wrote will all go to the council. And when will everything go to the council? Like when we're done? <laughs> when we're, at what point is the council gonna see the work that we've done so far? And that's all I have. Does anybody else have anything else before I open this up? For, go ahead. I am just want to say I'm opposed to capping off buildings at four stories. Um, I appreciate the diversity of opinions and the conversations we have here so much, and I, and I learn so much every time I come. I think that a lot of the people that I talk to who may be initially concerned about building size, when you talk through with them, what it means as far as affordability or density, how buildings might look. Um, I think uh, my experience has been that people often generally, in fact, uh, change their view. And I think we have to be careful about speaking to people's fears uh, about change, which are understandable, but we're tasked with solving a a housing crisis at the moment and I'm concerned that if we cap building heights at four or five stories that we're going to be diminishing our ability to address that problem right out of the gate and there's also an extent to which building height is leverage that we have with developers and when we restrict it to a four or five story building I think we're giving up leverage that is going to make hitting our housing goals uh, a lot more difficult. I, I also wonder um, how, how high is the BSS building on campus? Five stories? Um, is there any, and David, you may know this, but do we have a sense of whether or not the state is going to build eight story buildings to address housing for Cal Poly? which could essentially be an end run around anything that we're trying to do now. I don't know the answer to that question, but I'm curious because if the state is going to be building buildings above four or five or six stories in Arcata, then we're talking about limiting something. I don't know. I'm just curious how that, how that plays into um, limits that we're trying to set and, and what that might mean. I don't know. So how are you talking to people about what the buildings are going to look like? Because no one knows what these buildings are going to look like. And then also, we don't have the emergency. We don't even have to figure out if there was a fire or an earthquake or something, and we have all these people crammed into this eight-story buildings. Our fire department just sat here and told us they don't know how they would help those people. I'm, I'm like, there's so many things that haven't been worked out. And yeah, the an eight story building could be gorgeous, um, but we don't know. It's so vague. I just, I, we don't know. You want to respond? Yeah, I mean, I agree that those things are important. I'm just concerned that if we limit ourselves to four or five stories right now, that that's a mistake. That's, that's all I'm saying. I'm not saying those other concerns aren't realistic or. That's why I brought up my questions about the fire department in the beginning, because I think those are real. 
I think they're solvable. Clearly they're solvable because communities across the state solve them. We're not reinventing the wheel here when it comes to dealing with safety issues regarding a building over four or five stories. I, I also am not um, in favor of capping at four to five feet or four to five uh, stories. I think we need to provide opportunities for developers. And, you know, just like we've done all along, we've, you know, we've faced challenges and we get over them. So, you know, I mean, there's, there's opportunities, there's grants, you know, just like, uh, just like what David was just saying, um, you know, there's opportunities out there um, and we just have to discover them. So um, in respects to limiting ourselves, you know, right out the gate to, you know, to solve an issue, you know, not only with our housing, but also, you know, we, I think we're forgetting too that this is a multi-use structure. You know, I mean, opportunities for businesses as well to collect, you know, taxes from as, as well. So, um, you know, we limit to four stories. Now we only have three stories of housing. So, you know, that's another issue. Um, I think we should, you know, I don't think we should be focusing on the hypotheticals and so on and so forth. I think we're, you know, where are we going to come with the money and all this other sort of stuff? You know, it's, it, it has to, it's going to be coming from somewhere, whether it's through collecting, you know, collecting taxes, through grants, you know, there's, you know, it's being incentivized, you know, throughout the state to do these things. So, um, just, just saying that. Um, but also, I just wanted to ask a question, David. Um, what are the opportunities, you know, um, you know, with willing landowners to do some preliminary efforts and preliminary work? You know, what's the what are the opportunities in regards of getting permits to enter, um, to do preliminary evaluations? You know, to essentially um, streamline our process. Um, also, I recognize that it's probably going to be required for, you know, developing our EIR um, to uh, look at impacts. Um, you know, what's, th what's the discussion so far? I just wanted to clarify that when I said we need to cap, I didn't put a number on it. I just think that the public wants to hear that number. So, and I think that we've been hearing things from the Planning Commission of four, Dan said six. I've heard that you don't want to do at four to five, you wanna go more. I just think we need to land on a number um, so that people's fears are appeased and then we can move forward. But I feel like we're just gonna be spinning our wheels if we don't take eight stories off the table, or if we don't take it off the table, then let's figure that out. Whatever that number is, figure the number out, and then let's go and move forward, because this is where I see we're getting log jammed. Yeah, um, I, I, I'd like to um, reiterate Christian's question to you about um, what have the discussions been as far as um, all of those delineations so far, and at what point in the EIR process might it come up. But m more than that, um, I would also love to invite appropriate representatives of Cal State, Cal Poly Humboldt, uh, to come to the Planning Commission and to come to the City Council and to come to a broader range of city staff and explain to us what they believe their plans are for expansion to serve their needs off their current campus and to open those plans up to the um, views, scrutiny, comments, recommendations of the community which has served as their host and would love to continue to do so. Um, without that type of interaction, there is little basis for trust. And several university actions over the past few months have gone a long way to undermine the trust that had existed in the past. And so if that communication cannot happen, we have no reason 
to believe that the university will not plan to build eight-story buildings at the south end of GK or any other street. Um, but if they do, of course, they're going to have to take of make take care of making sure that um, the occupants of those buildings can be safe, um, and they're going to have to explain the potential significant environmental impacts of those buildings on the environment, on our community. And that process should also be open to our comments, and it shouldn't be done in a bureaucracy somewhere in Long Beach um, out of our purview. And, and, and yeah, um, Kimberly, last time you talked about elephants in the room, um, that's a pretty big elephant. I would love that elephant to come into our room and talk to us um, and to do it soon. Even if it's only to say, we don't know what our plans are. We're still thinking it through. This is, this is, this is all new to us. Tell us what's going on as it's happening. Don't throw it on our heads as a fait accompli. Um, and, and so, yeah, whatever we do here, I don't think the university is going to have to abide by it if it chooses not to. It would be so great if they were positive, good neighbor participants in our process. And I don't think there's a person in Arcata who would not really welcome that. Um, yay. So, but anyway, that, that question that Christian has. <laughs> do you want to comment or do you want me to open it up? Uh, it's totally up to you. There were a, a lot of questions. I can address them now, or if you want to have public comment first. Um, and I tried to track these um, with a little annotation, so if I miss something, feel free to pipe in. Um, I guess first I'll say uh, that you know there were a, a lot of comments around uh, the community amenities, and maybe I wasn't didn't describe it clearly enough, or maybe I'm missing something about the conversation, but. The list that's in the, the draft right now, um, you know, taking, taking suggestions. I think I heard most clearly from the chair about things that uh, should be removed. Um, folks had, um, you know, kind of high level comments, but if you want to go through these one by one and say, keep that, remove that, that'd be great. Um, I also want to reiterate that things like rapid production of new housing, which yes, that's the goal of this, is a category into which in the form-based code, you could have specific amenities identified. So if under rapid production of housing, you wanted to have within the first six months, a developer that comes in for, you know, uh, 60 units or more, you know, gets X as a, as a, you know, process benefit or something like that, because you really wanted to see rapid housing development, that would be the amenity. Rapid production of housing is the category. This is the policy level document. It's giving a category. With the green building design, for example, yes, MS4 requires that you keep all your, uh, your water on site. But some buildings are getting innovative and they're actually using those waters that they collect on site in the building. So they're recycle recycling that water. And so if you had something like that, that's a little bit above and beyond where we're at in terms of requirements. And so that could be amenity if the city wanted to see um, that sort of amenity. So when you read green building, um, that doesn't necessarily mean just what we're conceiving of it now. That means developing community amenities that go above and beyond in that category. So I just wanted to make sure you were aware of that. Uh, okay, so let's see, questions. When will this go to council? When will this go to council? So you're having uh, your uh, council planning commission joint study session on August 23rd. I think a lot of the questions that you're having today about uh, the you know building height and you know process and all of these questions, you're going to have a conversation about that, and hopefully we'll have some clarity out of that meeting. I think that's really the intent of that meeting. Um, but the document itself, uh, we're in the process now. We've gone through at least one round with almost all of the committees. We've gotten recommendations from the majority of those. 
Um, and we're in the process of uh, amending the document. As you recall from a few uh, meetings ago, we outlined a process where when recommendations came forward that uh, uh, uplifted or emphasized or improved on policy direction that's already in the draft document, we would incorporate those and identify the source of that, whether it's from a committee or public member or you know an agency. All of those will be incorporated in line, and we're in the process of doing that right now. I can't give you a specific timeline on when that's going to happen. We are balancing lots of other priority workloads simultaneously, but my hope is that within the next month, we will have that document ready for review. Those policy recommendations that are coming forward that uh, recommend that we go in a different direction from what's included in the document uh, or are run counter to our understanding at the staff level of uh, policy direction that we have elsewhere in uh, the city, uh, will, or where there's lots of disagreement uh, about you know, conflicts about, around recommendations, are going into a separate table. That table will track the element that's affected of the general plan, uh, the topic that it uh, is uh, concerning, what the recommendation is, uh, what the staff recommendation is, what the planning commission recommendation is, and what the policy implications of implementing that recommendation might be. So you've heard from the public, for example, I used this example when we looked at it on the, on the PowerPoint presentation. You've heard from the public, limit it to three. You've heard it from the public, limit it to four. You've heard from the public, keep it at eight. Those are all conflicting. So we'll put those conflicting uh, ideas into this tabular format, bring that forward to the decision makers, and have that recommendation go forward to the council ultimately. Um, and all of that will go together. The revised document with the inline identified changes and the tabular format changes that need to be considered. Ultimately, the council is the decision maker. They're going to say, include this policy, don't include that one. Make this change, don't make that one. We'll come back with a revised document that will then be the basis for uh, the, the EIR uh, and, and ultimately up for consideration for, for adoption. The intent is to have that document, you know, to get these things, we're, we're going as rapidly as we possibly can to try and collect all of this information and bring it back and uh, feed it back to the public, you know, show them how we've uh, dealt with their, their uh, questions and responses. And so I'm, that's, that's sort of my target right now, sometime over the next month. I've been setting a very aggressive timeline for the work product in, uh, in this, this plan. And we have, you know, admittedly fallen behind that aggressive timeline. Um, I fully believe that if I had set a less aggressive timeline, we would have also fallen behind those. Um, and so I'm maintaining that aggressive timeline, much to the chagrin of staff. Um, so month is my, what I'm shooting for. Uh, when will the letters be available? Uh, we had a public member who uh, is tracking our uh, every move very closely. Identify this to to the committee and I, uh, to the council uh, planning commission rather. And I wanted to I wanted to be the first to tell you this, but it got out ahead of me. The spoiler alert. We are now taking, uh, and we've heard this from the public, so we're responding to that. We're taking all of the communications that we received and putting them onto our website under the SERP page. So if you go to the uh, CERT page and you follow the uh, how do I get involved link, uh, which we're probably going to need to change the name of now because there's a lot more information in there than just how do you get involved. How do I get involved takes you to the outreach and engagement section. Within that section, we actually have a section where we're uploading uh, verbatim the comments. Uh, we're, uh, it's taking us a little time because we have to redact personal information from those, uh, which is why you're seeing them in bunches. Uh, but those, those are coming forward, and we'll continue to do that um, uh, through this entire process. The, uh, the policy before was to incorporate those comments into the, um, uh, the, the staff reports as we get them. But what was happening was that, you know, in, uh, information was trickling in from so many different sources and, and at different times, and people were wondering, well, why isn't my uh, you know, letter that I sent to you today in the staff report? Well, because the staff report was already published. So we're kind of transitioning now. All of that information is going to be online, located at this, uh, uh, at this website. Uh, so you'll be able to read them there. And then anything that comes in under the, uh, the EIRs, communications with the EIR, 
They'll be located in two places. They'll be located, we're going to continue this process where all the, the public comment will be uploaded in the same place. So anybody who's used to getting that information at that location, they'll go there, they'll find it. But we are legally required to house uh, correspondence that's related to the circulation of the EIR in the EIR and deal with those specifically and, and respond to them in the EIR. So you see them in there as well. So we're moving away from putting letters in the packets and moving into putting all that information on the website and making, uh, making the referral there. Uh, so that's, that's where you'll see the letters. And yes, to, to answer your question, uh, it's not going to be a summary. It's going to be verbatim what they said. We will continue to summarize in the engagement report uh, what we're hearing from the public from all different venues, whether it's the written correspondence or oral recordings or meetings. Um, the question uh, is the state planning to then that's Cal Poly planning to build eight stories. I don't have information on that, uh, unfortunately, but my uh, assumption would be because uh, again, they're not subject to our local regulations. My assumption will be is my operating assumption is that they're going to build uh, what they feel like they need to satisfy their housing requirements. Um, and I'll, I'll leave it at that. Uh, the, oh, to the question of like, are we going to enter negotiations, uh, with property owners to enter their properties to do, you know, phase one, phase two for this EIR level. We're not doing that. Um, there's, we're trying to, with a general plan EIR, you evaluate a high level uh, of analysis typically and allow for a broad range of activities reserving site-specific analysis for specific developments to those site specifics. And so a developer on any particular site would then have to come in and you know, pro provide a new EIR uh, for that site-specific development. One of the things, again, one of the hallmarks of this plan is that we're trying to go as deep as we can with the environmental analysis so that we free up as many constraints as are reasonable that we can do with fairly broad brush strokes uh, with, so that developers can come in, the majority of developers can come in and develop under a ministerial pathway, a principally permitted pathway. There are absolutely going to be site-specific conditions that we are not evaluating. Uh, the geology to determine uh, appropriate uh, uh, foundation design or you know, to, to meet seismic standards uh, or to evaluate uh, you know, soil contamination, those kinds of things will still have to uh, occur on some of the sites, the limited sites that have those, those particular uh, um, uh, impacts that they need to, to mitigate. Um, so we're going to do as much as we can with the site specific detail and we'll identify the areas where we know that we can. But again, we're also working with uh, specific landowners uh, for instance, we have about three landowners right now. Some are agency, some are private landowners that we're working with to do uh, EPA uh, targeted brownfield assessment grant for. Um, and so we're, we're collaborating, coordinating with those developers, even when they have these uh, impacts that are outside uh, of our, our specific focus for this EIR. Um, I feel like I'm missing some questions. Did I answer everyone's questions? Hey, David, I was I was more interested in um, <laughs> this is funny it's geology, but um, it's more uh, botanical, biological, cultural resources. You know those components. We're going to get to a moderate level with many of those components. Um, in particular, for biological resources, uh, they change over time. Um, and so, you know, we don't want to go in and say, okay, this area is, uh, you know, groovy to develop and then something changes and then it's not. Um, but, but we are doing over, you know, broad brush overview. The intent is to do a broad brush overview. So for example, there's a, a program in there to try and consolidate and develop out a, a mitigation bank of sorts for wetlands so that we have a plan that's already developed for how wetlands could be uh, consolidated, enhanced, and uh, provide higher quality wetland complexes within the district uh, where right now there may be more scattered, um, you know, lower quality uh, wetlands. Um, so, so doing the legwork to provide the, the framework for that program, but then leaving it to the specific development to come in and do um, uh, their own 
wetland delineation to figure out how much area they need to mitigate, for example. Yeah, it's my understanding is the majority of these studies only last five years or, you know, they're, they're limited in respects to the, you know, the mobility of, uh, of, of vegetation and, you know, wildlife and so forth. So, and also same thing with hazardous waste. So. All right, are we ready to open this up to public comment? Please step forward and please say your name. And, and I don't have my clock, so try to keep it in just a few minutes if you can. Thank you. If you'd like, Chair, I'm more than happy to set a timer. Don't worry, I'll be quick because I'm headed up to the Arcata Chamber of Commerce Mixer at the Arcata Theater Lounge, and there may be some university people there I can tell um, to come down here, but we don't have free alcohol, so. Um, but anyway, uh, I just want to say, kind of in general, hindsight is 2020, of course. But um, in the course of this whole gateway um, plan that's been uh, in our face for the last few months, um, I've had the opportunity to talk to young people. And I came here last time and spoke about my concern about the next generations. And um, a couple of the people I've talked to, uh, the youth, um, high school student who was very interested when I told that student about this plan, who she had no knowledge of it, but was sort of interested. But there's very little opportunity and incentive, I guess, in some ways for the next generations to speak up now about what they want their community to look like. The other was a, a person who's now in college away from here, in um, Berkeley, actually. and. Uh, the comment from that person was, you know, if they're talking about high rises, why didn't they do it north of town when they built those, you know, new housing things that are just two stories um, on, on Foster and, and such? So, you know, I know this is all after the fact type of thing, but moving forward, um, I really do think it's important to really consider livability as much as we're considering height and amenities and all that kind of thing. And, and, and I could tell you some stories of my personal experiences as I have observed things at Sorrel Place, which is oftentimes used as the foil, as David mentioned um, in a previous meeting. But um, height really does matter in terms of livability. And what we talk about is putting roofs over people's heads, but we don't talk about the roof. And um, places like Sorrel Place to totally underutilize, I think, the rooftops. And when we're talking about future design, if we talk about open spaces and we talk about the need for people to have access to the outside, you know, indoor hallways, uh, I know this is coming into the design concept, but is that the time, David? It was. Okay, gosh, I was uh, a lot longer than I thought. But I'm headed out and I'll see if I can uh, get some people to come down here. <laughs> So thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have a three minute timer, correct? I, I set it for two, you want it to be three? Um, I'll be as quick as I can. Uh, I, I work from a spreadsheet better. I took the benefits and I know that this is a draft. I made a spreadsheet which I can hand out. Um, my father was an engineer. I value the contributions of engineer in our society. Uh, so much of the plan seems like a bunch of numbers. Um, we're not dealing with housing units. We're dealing with homes. We're not dealing with numbers. We're dealing with people. And I want to keep reminding us of that. Uh, I would recommend that any mention of housing units be converted to the word bedrooms because density can always be increased by making smaller units, by making micro studio units, you can always increase density, which is not what the people of Arcata need necessarily. Uh, Sorrel Place, for all of its detriments, is made up of one, two, and three story, uh, excuse me, one, two, and three bedroom units, which is for families and, and normal groups. Um, the uh, several, I, I applaud the commissioners for your comments. Um, as we know, there are sections which are uh, odd. Um, it says housing is to be affordable for the full range of Arcadian household incomes. I don't see that happening in this current plan. Um, 
There is a uh, discussion of the state bonus. Um, I spoke with the, um, the developer of that building in Santa Cruz uh, that I, I like the design of. And, um, and I know our situation is different from theirs. And, and uh, David, I, I look forward to your uh, view there. But he, he, in Santa Cruz, clearly, you, get, um, you can go higher with density bonuses. But again, it's a different situation. Um, but he, he clearly said that that's what they're, they're doing. Um, the, um, I have an article about the Santa Cruz property. And um, Sorrel Place, as I said, I like it with a mixture of bedrooms. But it's, it's a bad design in lots of ways. I encourage you to go to the arcadaone.com website where I talk about that. I'd like to remind, is that three minutes? Pardon? That was two. I believe the chair said two minutes. Uh, halfway done. <laughs> uh, um, Are you going to extend the time? Okay, you yeah. want to go four minutes? Is that where we're? Okay. I, I just want to make the point that affordable housing doesn't mean bad design. You can have good design with affordable. Um, the um, uh, Commissioner Mayor, I respect what you said about talking with Cal Poly. However, I don't think I will trust anything they say. Um, that's me. Um, Redwood City, as we know, has a discretionary from the Planning Commission uh, for the taller buildings. And I talked to them. They say it's smooth sailing with the developer knows what the city wants. It's specified. There's not, a, not it's, it's very, very quick process for them. Uh, acquiring land for parks, I applaud that. I've got two articles about parks on arcata1.com. Um, we seem to be using the phrases ministerial review and discretionary review in different ways at different times. Uh, ben Noble pointed out there's three options for ministerial review, one of which is planning commission review. Uh, at some point, we'll figure out the actual definitions there. Um, I, uh, uh, Commissioner Tagney had asked about learning about form based code. I do have four or five articles on arcata1.com because I learned about it. I put those articles up there. I spoke with the Form Based Code Institute. They have courses. The way they have their courses is not likely to be of value for us, unfortunately. Um, in terms of the building height, um, I want to put in a plea for uh, more districts. Uh, certain districts might be amenable to higher building height more than others. And um, I feel it's, very, it's a very site-specific situation. The area that I look at is where the soilscape building at the far end of the industrial property I think you could put a 12-story building there, and it, it wouldn't have solar shading. It would be by itself. Something could be written that, as the in the as the future, you know, as time progresses, that might be the spot to put the tallest buildings with fire department approval and, and that sort of thing. But not limit it to overall to four. But if again, that would involve creating four or five or three or four more districts. Um, some examples of where uh, four-story might not even be possible is, is the Amerigas site. Or the uh, where clothing dock and German Motors is, you know that. Oops. Okay, we're done. Thanks very much. Thank you. <laughs> I would like to bring attention to a, a pretty good article, the Miami News Times, October two thousand and twenty-one, because it's a Winwood Miami project that basically is very similar to what you're doing right now. Um, a lot of the issues are in that article. Um, so it isn't something that you're just kind of thinking about the future. And you're, you have a community that's responding to a, a development. And it was a pri primarily a Latin community. And I think at the time of the article was in, our, in October, they were building the high rises, which were a half a dozen. So. It's in interesting to see the perspective from that community on what they thought about the height. And um, it just it gets into the arts and entertainment uh, issue because I don't think a lot of detail has been spelled out that. And that sort of came out last night in a, in a strange way with getting a per permit for uh, entertainment for the around the creamery building. So it, it sort of, that kind of fits into your design um, of, of this district, how that noise is going to uh, be set up as far as parameters. And it was interesting. 
I was just amazed how they went around and got permission from everybody to extend it to a certain time and how how loud the noise was. But I mean, you're gonna be putting a lot of people in that area and you're also wanting an arts and entertainment district and you really haven't done your homework, I don't think, on that. And I think you can learn a lot from that article in that regards because they're known for that. They're, they're uh, known for Wynwood Walls, which is pretty, Nat, world kind of renowned event that people come to and look at the, the murals in that area. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity to to learn for the Gateway Project from that. And I don't think very many of you have lived in high rise buildings too. So you're sort of making a lot of decisions based on the fact that you haven't even lived in there. And so you need to like um, maybe listen to what folks have to say that have lived in those situations. And I brought this up last time about the storage of the bicycles. And uh, I can see what's happening in, even with Sorrel Place that they don't have a place. So it's pretty creative how people are putting them over their balconies with the wheels hanging out. So it's particular safety issues. And um, so I don't know whether you're taking all this in, but maybe you need to talk to people that have lived in the, uh, that sort of environment. And so you can uh, come up with the solutions instead of waiting to see what is going to happen with the big experiment. Thanks. Hey, can you remind us the reference on the article? Um, Miami News Times, Wynwood, Miami. And I actually found it from with a search topic uh, Wynwood, Miami gentr gentrification, and it pops up as the number one article. So it goes through the whole history of the area. You know, it's a blue collar area that was um, Puerto Rican there, um, primarily, and it was um, basically in manufacture of shoes and, and clothing, and then it, it sort of went downhill and they, they brought up an idea to bring in the arts and entertainment and do an infill project. So it's been going on for about 21 years and I, I see it every year. So it's sort of like, and I can tell you, you know, the pros and cons, but I'll let the article talk to that. Thanks. Anyone else before we close? We have a, uh, oh, at least one ahead. online. Go ahead, Jane. Hi, me again. Um, I've listened to all this and I just want to emphasize a couple of things. Um, one, it's been, this, this, it's been mentioned that we have existing, pre-existing specific requirements already in our land use plan versus being amenities such as electrification and so forth. Um, I think we should revisit the land use plan as Judith mentioned to see if we need to add requirements to that, not just discuss them in terms of gateway plan. So that's another issue. And that would be something that could be done um, at the Community Advisory Committee. I also understand there's a lawsuit by developers in a case finding in January that I've heard about, um, I don't remember the specifics, that uh, the area had a four-story limit, but they indicated that it could be increased by 20% or so if it had a certain uh, amount of affordable housing. So you could set a limit and lose, if that case stands, um, you need to understand the implications of that, particularly if we're trying to build affordable housing. So if we set a limit of six, and then they uh, want to do affordable housing and that's case law, then you could basically have a problem of ending up with seven or eight story buildings, whether you wanted them or not. Um, and Cal Poly, I totally agree, we need to have them come and talk to us sooner rather than later to see what they're doing. Obviously they've jumped the um, project from 850 students to 1,050, so I don't know whether that implies higher buildings, uh, et cetera. We obviously need to be aware of unit issues related and, and need to specify what a unit is. 
So I think it's very important that we get down to the specifics when we're talking about these, like if we need to have a maximum intensity, uh, we'd better define that now rather than later. Um, so I'd like to have us get down to specifics and address the various divisive issues. And there is a list of those issues we have in our um, discussion of what would be tackled by the Citizen Community Advisory Committee. So that will be forthcoming. Um, I'm sure it's not exhaustive. We can find people willing and able to dis dispute any number of things. But we need to address each of those divisive issues one by one um, and try to draw some conclusion. But our concern is we don't have a representative sample of citizen input to date. And we haven't still summarized what was on all those little post-its um, at the two-day uh, town hall. So I think that's a problem. And that's something that could be done by the advisory committee. It's got to be a working committee. And we'll be talking about that next week um, at, at your committee meeting. And uh, looking forward to that. Uh, but it would be very nice to be able to define these specific issues and get them resolved so you can make specific recommendations. But I think you're going to need an advisory committee to um, help address that. And that means some time devoted. Uh, you need good people on it. We had wonderful people on the Plaza Improvement Task Force from specific areas. It was a working committee, and that's what this would need to be. We'll be talking about that in the future. Thanks for everything you do. Um, and Judith, I would love to see what you would propose needed to be added to the general plan, which we're all talking about the gateway plan. But I think we need to talk about what needs to be added, what, what existing requirements exist in the general plan, and what needs to be added there. All right, thank you very much. That's all for folks. Thank you. Go ahead, Chris. Uh, yeah, hello, Chris Richards again. Um, I, I don't have a whole lot. I know this meeting's getting up there in time for everyone. Um, I did want to resonate with a couple things that uh, Vice Chair uh, Judith Myers said and the the whole idea of uh, really defining the vision for the general plan 2045 i think is a pretty critical point that you know you're trying to move all this together and do it all at the same time and it it uh, it, it definitely you know can become a conflict down the road if if you one thing negates the other or you know it's not well thought out between the two of them you know, and then I know trying to merge them together is uh, is the final goal. But I, I I do think that it's a big lacking of the vision, and especially you know once the draft came out and with Cal, Cal Poly's change, and you know everybody's like, well, where are we going and what are we doing? So I I really think that's a great idea to really get that dialed in. And there's a lot of mechanisms that have been talked about tonight that will help do that. Um, the other thing is um, I've been writing letters and uh, trying to uh, be in correspondence at the state level with Cal Poly folks and, you know, uh, the the chancellor and, you know, we lost we lost uh, Castro and we now have, you know, we've got another new person that's taking over from there. But um, I do have a one stop shopping list and I try to encourage folks. I know a lot of folks aren't uh, media folks. Uh, I have a uh, developed a Facebook page and I have a one-stop shopping list for all of the contact information for folks and I I do uh, really encourage people to write letters and send emails and uh, you know uh, Mike McGuire's office was very responsive and uh, you know they they always respond they, they they think seem to be thinking about things with what's happening here specifically but on the local level and the state level at the university system uh, it's crickets i i don't get any response from them so i think more more letters would be helpful uh, anyway uh, that's all i have thank you so much for all you do and 
I appreciate your efforts very much. Thank you, Chris. Go ahead, Scott. <clears throat> Good evening, commissioners. Um, Scott McBain. Um, I'll be probably the shortest speaker. Um, I just wanted to, to give an update on um, some of the comments that um, Commissioner White mentioned at the last meeting about doing a survey, a quantitative survey, and um, Jane also mentioned this. I just want to let you guys know that I've been doing some work um, on trying to get a more definitive um, proposal on how to do this in a uh, quantitative survey that would inform us a little bit better. And I'll share um, some of the results of that um, next week. So I just wanted to let you know that um, I'll have some stuff to share next week. Oops. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thanks. Oops. <clears throat> Got too many mice. Go ahead, Greg. All right, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, you can hear me? All right, great. Sorry, but the mute thing always throws me. Um, well, first of all, thank you for your service. Um, really appreciate you all being there. Also want to um, basically just um, confirm, you know, everything Judith Mayer said. I really appreciate um, her insights. And I think that her um, talents, if you will, and her background uh, really um, is important here because she's helping to decipher a lot of this. And, and you all have done great work. I really appreciate it. Um, and I'm, I'll be short, too, because there's so much to discuss. You know, the building heights are one thing. Livability, it's also important. Um, I just did a little walk about through town um, a couple days ago, you know, about 5 p.m. or so. And once again, I, I go back to the cars, you know, and I own a car. I drive it around. Um, I think if Arcata doesn't get on top of the transportation issues and really ramp down the ability to drive everywhere and to idle, everywhere. I mean, the diesel trucks going by, a friend and I are trying to have a conversation. We hadn't seen each other in a while, and it was almost impossible, you know, at, uh, at um, G and 10th or 11th, and, uh, you know, really bad corner, but just really uh, unpleasant. And the, the plaza was unpleasant, uh, and just people circling their cars, and, you know, street people have to have a place to go but that's all the people you see there now. And I think people don't feel safe. If you get the cars off the plaza, that will help. And when you move these people in to the Gateway Project, and they're coming with cars, I don't care what David Loya says about making it attractive to people who aren't going to have cars. Um, you know, that's just a recipe for making this city completely unlivable. Small city. Uh, so... There's many measures that can be taken. Um, I hope to provide input on that, but the car thing is not really being looked at adequately and needs to be a, a master plan needs to be developed in real time alongside the GPU, uh, separate from it, but a master plan for uh, really making Arcata a much friendlier place. <clears throat> and that means ramping back on the ability to drive anywhere you want, anytime you want. And then you're going to see more bikes and families and pedestrians, and it's going to be safer and lovelier, and that's the direction we need to go. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. I am not seeing any other uh, public comment. Okay, we will close the public comment portion, and then, so, We've expressed our opinion, but we have not made any decisions um, as far as what we want um, to recommend to the council. Um, so I kind of thought as some things, maybe we can take a straw vote and maybe we can make a decision on a few things. Um, we're scheduled to talk about the design stuff next time as well, um, which is less than a week from now on Tuesday. Um, I, I wonder if we could just go through systematically and 
address specific items that are in the draft plan and add that and spend our meeting on Tuesday really focused on that um, in part so that each of us will have been able to go through in, de in detail and look at the policies and be ready to make specific recommendations in detail on those policies, um, including uh, stuff that's not there now that we think should be added and possibly policies that should be deleted or massively changed altogether. But to, to just kind of go, go through. Yeah, I'm asking specific questions. It, yeah, um, I'm not sure that we're all prepared to do that in detail at this meeting. And, and if, we, if there were a meeting where we knew that we were gonna be called on to do that in detail, um, we, could, we could be ready to roll. Just let me finish my thoughts. So these are things that we talked about tonight. And if we don't want to take a straw vote, we're a team here. But the questions I was going to ask is, do we want to limit or not limit the height? Do we want um, to have a max on density or do we not want to have a max on den density? And then I think we're prepared to possibly go over table six categories of community amenities. We can possibly go over what we feel as an amenity and what we don't. And those are the only questions I was going to ask. Because we did have a lot of discussion about those things tonight. But it's up to the pleasure of the commission. On the amenities topic, it feels like that could go on for quite a while. And I'm wondering just what our time frame is. Um, and if there's not enough time, I like what Judith said about being prepared to really dive straight into that. We have Next to be Tuesday. done by seven because Scott oh, needs okay. to leave. Is that our yeah, time or, frame? Yeah, or before would be good. But yeah. Okay. <laughs> so do you think, okay, so do you want to come back next week then and talk, or next week, it is next week, and talk about table six? Yeah, that sounds great. Uh, what about the other? The density thing, I don't see necessarily how we would do a straw poll vote on that because forming a question to vote on wouldn't, reflect the gateway plan as it's written it's a community benefit it's on page 49 under developmental standards maximum density there's there is no maximum dent density and I just wanted to know if we were okay with having no maximum density or not yeah, I, th I think that if I could just interject real quick, if the commission wanted to have a, a conversation or take, you know, take a vote on that, that would probably be the first question, you know, should we have a maximum density? Um, and if that garners support, you know, maybe what I would recommend because we don't, you know, we can't just come up with the maximum density on the fly. Um, yeah, that, that, that would, that would suffice. Like, do you right now the way that the the uh, plan is structured there's no maximum density and it allows the market to build out the types of units that the market needs so do you want to change that uh, and there may be cascading uh, changes that we'll need to make within the document um, if that changes but do you want to change that and if so uh, let's set aside what that maximum density should be until a later discussion well if it's I just thought if everybody said, no, we're fine, no maximum, we wouldn't even have to vote on. I just wanted, I was trying to get the feeling how, how everybody was feeling. But if you're not, if you, we aren't prepared to answer those questions, maybe we need to come, you and I need to put that on the agenda and come up with some specific questions and start getting some of these questions answered so we can get this plan developed the way that it needs to be. Um, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, th I think, get, especially given the variety of different types of dwelling units that we've heard described here, um, you know, some of which are tiny, some of which are big, some of which are designed for one person, some of which are designed for, you know, for students, others are designed for a family of seven, um, that before we would talk about having a maximum density of dwelling units per acre, which is how densities are typically expressed, um, we, we might want to talk about what, what we're thinking of as a dwelling unit. Um, because, you know, a maximum density for 
uh, student housing where a dwelling unit is a tiny efficiency for one person is a really different thing than a, a maximum density for um, you know, three bedroom apartments. E each would be considered a unit. And so it, it's hard to know how we would reasonably address that without first talking about the range of dwelling units that we would even be addressing. Um, you know, I don't understand anything. Three, three or four hundred, a, a three hundred square foot student um, st student room with a bathroom and maybe you know a, a two burner hot plate um, is really different than a three bedroom apartment or a four bedroom house. Each could be considered a dwelling unit, and so. In terms of you know what we're talking about for maximum densities, we, I think the question we'd have to look at before that is: Do we want to talk about um, types of dwelling units? On the density topic, does somebody have concern about it being left to market forces? Is too much density like a, a in the back of somebody's mind as a concern or? I mean, if, if I'm understanding what you said earlier, David, that if there is a density maximum, then it just creates a situation where developers are incentivized to build alternative units to make an end run around that density limitation. Is that correct? Um, that's been my experience with um, some developments in the city. Um, many jurisdictions do have uh, upper density limits. Um, and, you know, it's, you know, there's a, a relationship. And again, you know, a lot of this we'll address in a little bit more detail in the uh, study session. But there's a relationship between, you know, the density, the building massing, and, you know, the number of units uh, um, or the number and type of units. Uh, and then that relationship to, you know, the amount of, um, you know, open space. Like all of these things are related, right? Um, and so if you look, you know, at the, the tea gardens, for example, where, which was the first project that I'd seen where they basically took the, the density and quadrupled it by making these quad apartments. Which so, project is that? The tea gardens? Yeah, where are they? Oh, at? I'm sorry. It's right up F Street here, the brown and red. On 11th. Yep. Yep. F and 11th. Right across from the so when you, when, you, when you leave here tonight, because I know you're going to want to do nothing else but to think more about this when you leave here tonight. Uh, go down to F and 11th and look at the, the brown building that's closest. This is on the north side of 11th, closest to the highway. It's the biggest building on the site. Okay, it's the biggest building on the site. And the reason is because um, it has nine units total, but there's nine times, 40, uh, nine times four uh, bedrooms. So, you know, it's just, it, it is an example of how, you know, there are going to be ways of getting around that. And so the, the idea here was to be as, um, you know, as hands off as possible to really incentivize the, you know, the, the developers to come in and build out what, what the community needs. Some of those things are going to be market driven. We're not going to be able to dictate what the community needs at any given time. Some of those things we are going to really be able to dictate. You know, we want high quality uh, trails. We want high quality uh, recreational spaces. And so we can dictate those those elements of it. And so it's it's a little, you know, the laissez-faire in terms of like uses and numbers of units that are built into the plan, the way it's currently structured, um, is a way to ensure that the developers can come in and whatever those market conditions are at the time, really maximize their profits so that they can translate some of those profits into our community benefits. Um, so setting an upper limit on, on density could have absolutely no impact. Um, I've got some density calculations I'll share with you and, and looking at, uh, you know, some pretty intensive developments, uh, uh, standards, uh, you can go up to even as low as like 60, 70 units per acre and still hit, you know, uh, you know, seven, eight story buildings. And so I don't think that, you know, if, if we were to set an upper density limit of, you know, 70 units per acre, I mean, I'd have to research this a little bit based on, on um, you know, site conditions, but 70 units per acre, you're still going to get, you know, pretty high density in, in that. Um, and it, 
it will have set an upper limit to density and those developers then will you know have both the height limitations the and and the density limitations to then work with one of the challenges that we have with the more standards that we add in there the more limitations that we add into to the code in terms of you know how they interrelate is that you 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 end up with a situation where uh, where one standard wouldn't limit you, but another one will. And we're absolutely going to have that in this plan. By by design, we're going to have that. Uh, I mentioned the gateway, uh, the barrel district earlier is the only place where eight-story buildings are allowed in the current plan. Um, and it's it's not uh, clear from the the policy language, but we, what we've been talking about with the public in terms of the the standards that would be in the form-based code is that, that there would be limitations, setback limitations on those eight-story buildings. And so on a par property like, uh, you know, the Barrel District, you might end up with a maximum of, say, four or maybe six at the most eight-story buildings. Everything else, once those, eight story, they, those four eight-story buildings are in, there's no more. Um, or we could limit it to two. So even though district-wide, you would look at the code and you'd say, okay, you'd flip through it and you find Barrel District and it says you can build the 90 feet, eight stories maximum. You would go into the zoning code and see, oh, well, you can only build one eight-story building every 1,500 feet. And so, you know, you peg that out on a, a grid and that's, that's the, you know, further limitation that happens. In our current code, we have things like floor area ratio. Floor area ratio is a combination of, you know, site coverage and, um, uh, uh, and building height. And so if you have site coverage, building height, and floor area ratio, you get into situations where the three of those don't necessarily all add up, and you might have one, generally it's floor area ratio, uh, leading on the limitation. Um, so moving away from a code that is you know, highly structured like the one that we have right now that puts a lot of confines and limits and, and, and standards on development to one that's more focused on the look and feel of the buildings, how they interact with the public sphere, this more of a form-based code concept, uh, will allow that flexibility. And so that's part of the reason why right now there's no upper upper limit on, on density in there. But, you know, certainly if the city, if the planning commission wants to recommend that, and the, the council wants to adopt, uh, you know, uh, density limitations, it's it's done all the time. It just adds one more standard that, that could have an impact on, you know, project down the road. Well, I, the reason I want to, I think we should have a maximum is because um, there are going to be developers out there, and I know it's not supposed to be about money, but it is. That's what developers do. They're here to make money, and I can, I could see a developer just packing people in. Um, they're low, you know, low income, you know, stress. I can see overcrowding, unhealthy environment. I think we need to hold developers' feet to the fire, and they need to build quality housing that has the room where they're just not all packed in that's that's not what that's just not the right thing to do and i feel like there needs to be a maximum or we could potentially end up with some developer who's just going to pack people in it'll be a horrible environment people will get in they won't be able to get out and we need to protect them so i i think we really need to look seriously about a maximum density because we need to protect our people so that's where i'm coming from because I've seen, we've all seen that happen. You read about it in the newspapers. We read about it, people. There's a couple of developers or um, landlords in Eureka that do things like that. And we don't want to do that here. It. So you were going to say I, something? I, it, the, the first thing was just a question um, for David. I, there, there is no floor area ratio um, on this chart here. Does that mean that the... Um, that some other part of the zoning code would apply, or uh, will there be no floor area ratio as a as a building standard at all in in this version? Yeah, floor floor area ratio is not a concept in this plan. Um, it is by far the <laughs> unintended, uh, by far the um, most limiting. You you. you we could add floor, again, we could add floor area ratios in here. If you set your floor area ratio at seven, you would never hit it. 
Okay, so uh, in, other, in other words, that's not an oversight. It's explicitly excluded in right. the gateway area standards yeah, that you, you can you're rely envisioning. On, uh, you know, open space requirements um, to to address some of those those uh, concerns. Um, and to Julie's point, you know, you can rely on you know uh, on-site amenities. Right now, for example, in our um, code for multifamily projects, there's a requirement for you know uh, private outdoor open space. It's kind of a ridiculous requirement. We really need to change it, but it was an attempt to make sure that there was some quality space for you know, each unit to have some outs outside space. Um, I don't think we've had a single project that's ever come in and actually built out the full amount that's in, in the code. They've all asked for an exception to that code and the Planning Commission has invariably granted those requests because um, it's not designed well right now. So it's an indication to us we need to change it. But those kinds of you know things, like if you wanted to say, look, if you have uh, you know in the in the code, if you have a um, you know uh, development over you know 40 units, you have to include you know some sort of on-site uh, amenity for the the residents. The Sorrel Place is a good example where there's there's sort of like a community room, you know, where uh, you know since the units are small, if you want to have family or friends over, you can rent out or rent. I think it's free, but you you reserve the community room. There's a kitchen in there, there's games in there, those sorts of things. And so I think that through the, the um, you know, the code requirements, the standards, you can start to, uh, you know, ensure that you don't have these, you know, uh, you know dy dystopian outcomes of, you know, people just packed into to cracker boxes. Well, state law, the California density bonus law has some, um, floor area ratio, if you have 20% of the units very low income, there's quite a bit of um, bonuses in there. You know, you can have um, special par parking ratios of a one-tenth of a space per affordable unit. And I mean, there's some good bonuses. Uh, Julie, are you looking at the enabling legislation part of it or, or the mandatory part that's um, imposed on cities? Law. Okay. Um, I, I, I guess what, I, what, what I'm wondering about as far as just a yes and no on do we want to have a maximum density listed there it is to remember that some of this housing, in fact, I would think that quite a bit of it um, that many people are envisioning for the gateway would be actual housing uh, geared towards students. Um, who might have very small personal spaces um, and which might mean that a, a unit could be 300, 400 square feet or less. Um, and so if you put a density bonus there, you're, you're inherent, inherently um, limiting the, the number of um, those units that would be possible to develop and and thereby possibly just in that one action alone making it really difficult to achieve the affordable housing um, goals f for students that I think are one of the driving forces of of the proposal um, I, I I'm not saying we, sh we shouldn't vote on it but I think that you know the idea of equating a, a, a three-bedroom apartment as a unit with, you know, a one-bedroom tiny studio is is a little problematic. Right. Well, that's, I mean, we're going to have to make some decisions, and I guess we'll come back. I mean, we're going to have to make some hard decisions because um, we have to make recommendations to the city council when this is all said and done. So maybe um, David and I will work on that coming up with some questions so we can start deciding what we want to recommend. Okay. I mean, and that's one of the questions. There's a million of them. I mean, if, if, yeah. if you want to no, do a do set of time. straw votes tonight, I mean, why, why not do it? We might come up with some things that we want to rethink later on that way. On the density thing, maybe come up with some language that then we could yeah. say yes or no on. Yeah, we'll, we'll work on it when he gets back from vacation. All right, what else? So we're going to go Building over this. Building height was your third topic. I'm sorry. 
building height was the other topic. Um, these are just things, ideas that I can't, I just wanted us to start making some decisions. Um, I had three questions and so I'll bring this back to you, um, not this week, but our next meeting. Uh, limit or not limit height, the max, do we want a max or we do not, do not want a max density, what do we want? And then um, just going over this categories of community amenities, are these really amenities? Mm -hmm. Do we want to take anything off? Do we want to add anything? Um, that's just the questions I came up at the, at the moment, but I'll go through and try to come up some more and give them to you guys ahead of time so you can really be thinking about this at our next meeting after next. All right, so that's all we're going to do on that. So go ahead. Meeting after next meeting. Well, our next meeting is with the, uh, it's the study session, right? No. You have a, you have a meeting next oh, week. Oh, when's the study session? The one after that? Yeah, August 23rd is the study session. So you have a, you have a meeting next week, August 9th. And um, I will not be here for that. Um, I'll be on, on vacation. Um, and we, in, we intend to bring a couple of land use items to you and we'll bring back this design, uh, the community and mini section so that you can uh, take, we'll take notes on that. We'll bring a red pen and a, a yellow highlighter to, to uh, mark up the document. And then, um, what I'm hearing you say, Chair, is that at the next meeting, in addition to being prepared to have that conversation, you want to have the conversation to prime for the conversation with the council on the 23rd around building height and that sort of thing. And I think that's, you've already started that discussion. I think it's been really productive. I think that, you know, having that, that discussion on the uh, 9th for the 23rd would be a good, good plan. Yeah, so we'll have to quickly come up with some questions for the so that they can you guys can think about it over the weekend and next week and then um, the other thing I had on here was the gateway plan advisory committee um, so are we having a presentation from Scott McBain next next meeting yeah August okay. 9th and then that's one of the things we're going to talk about at the study session with the City Council right about that, or is it just completely up to the city council? Um, you know, it's not at this point on the uh, the agenda for the study session. Um, I am not sure when or if the uh, city council is taking that up. I believe that uh, the vice chair uh, is, uh, the vice mayor rather is in conversation with, uh, with Scott. So I'm not sure where they're at on that, those discussions. Um, but at the last meeting, um, you know, there was an indication that, that the commission wanted to uh, have that presentation. So. Right now, it's on for, for next week, um, and so you'll, you'll hear that, and if you, um, you know, you'd be looking forward to taking that up then. Could, could I ask a really quick question? Yes. So the agenda for the study session on 823 is set by council only? We don't get input? So the council's meeting, yeah, they're, they're setting the agenda, I believe, um, and I don't want to... Yeah, yeah. There was there was some conversation with the the chair of the planning commission um, about the agenda, but yeah, ultimately the the mayor, in this case the vice mayor, is setting the agenda. Um, I wonder if we have any word yet which members of the council will be able to, um, to attend that. We know that one will not. Um, do we know if we will be having four people or three people able to attend? Um, I am not 100% sure on, on that as well. I know you'll have at least, uh, you know, uh, Brett, Sarah, and uh, Meredith. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure where, where um, you know, Alex is going to land. Thank you. Uh, I'm hoping that we don't discuss the uh, <clears throat> topic of the advisory committee at that study session with the council just because it seems like it could end up taking the entire meeting I don't think we yeah are. yeah i'm glad to hear that it's probably not on the agenda it's not specifically on the agenda we are going to have a conversation around process um and and timeline uh, but the majority of the conversation at this point looks like it's focused on uh you know uh building height uh you know how how you know how big we want to go in 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 the area and so there's there's some some primer on that also in it um I guess I'll wait for report outs. Okay, if, is there anything else? If not, we can go on. Is there any communi uh, correspondence or communications? 
Sorry, just looking at the agenda now, there's no correspondence or communication section because it's a special meeting. Oh, okay. All so right. I, I will mention uh, to the Planning Commission and uh, as an opportunity to, to speak to the public as well that um, August 16th, August 16th, we're having the uh, second step in the design work, which again is part of the development of form-based code and or design standards. Uh, and that will largely focus on uh, building massing as well. And so it'll be a nice segue uh, and primer for the discussion with the council on the 23rd. Um, if I can stay up between now and when I leave, I'm also gonna try and record some short um, uh, videos uh, there'll be primers uh, or pieces of the presentation that we'll make uh, at the, the City Council Planning Commission joint study session, and those will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. Um, we're also working on trying to uh, get a, a slightly different structure on our engagement page so that the, um, the videos that folks are interested in that are related to our uh, gateway planning efforts are actually listed in that, that um, uh, engagement page. So instead of having to go to the YouTube channel and then search for it and find it, you can click on the link and open it up directly from our page to the YouTube channel. Um, and then lastly, um, it was pointed out to me today, and I don't know how I missed this or if I knew it before and forgot it, but the, um, the photographs from the town hall the, the community at the community center that we had where you know, we invited the public to come down and put stickies on the wall, um, those have been up on our website for, you know, uh, you know, well over a month, maybe about two months now. Uh, but it was pointed out to me today, or I, I realized today, that the, um, the post-its are illegible. You cannot see what, is, what the post-its say. Um, we have very high quality uh, photo images of all the posters with the, the post-its on them. You can zoom in and read every post-it if you want to. We're going to be uploading those um, soon, sometime within the next week. Uh, so that folks can see, you know, go in and see those. I know that's been a concern of folks. Um, and then also related to that, the draft engagement report is on our website. It has been, again, for, you know, a couple months now since we presented it to council uh, uh, several several weeks back. And so if people are interested in seeing that, um, it's also uh, on that same web page uh, where all the engagement uh, material is located. Question on the 16th, are we invited? Is that, that's not a meeting, that's a training or a presentation. Public, yeah, public meeting, public presentation. Uh, ben Noble, our, uh, one of our consultants, is going to uh, lead it along with uh, Sella, one of, another of our consultants who, who's focused on engagement. Um, and then staff will be uh, interspersed and mixed in. And there. we're welcome to be there? You're welcome to be there, yep. Um, and it, it is at what time and where? It's going to be on Zoom. The time is? At six. So it's Zoom only. It's not an in-person thing. Uh, okay. Zoom only. Um, yeah, and the intent behind this is that there will be some uh, polling questions that we conduct throughout the meeting so that we can gather some instant uh, uh, results. Um, and what we're hoping to be able to do with all of these, uh, and again, it's it's another you know another task on the on the very long list of tasks that we'd like to do. But what we're hoping to be able to do is to then uh, produce these as uh, short YouTubes that folks can then take, you know, independently. They don't have to be there on the day of the meeting. Problem with having a meeting date is it doesn't work out for everyone, right? But if it's an enduring engagement that folks can then go and then get the link for the the questions, they can watch the video and participate sort of at their own pace. So that's, that's kind of one of the plans for this as well. And since we'll all be there, we all need to not comment on anything. We're just going to keep quiet and listen. So it's not a Brown Act violation. OK. Um, oh, it is? OK. How will we know you were talking about if you're able to try to put up some videos? How will we, will you send us something to the Planning Commission saying you put them up? or? Thank you. Uh, what I said was, uh, we'll uh, certainly notify the Planning Commission uh, during oral communications. Uh, we'll also send out e-notifications. I already got my e-notification. All right, anything else? If not, this meeting is adjourned.